It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Renee Ritchie's here. Andy Anako's here. Uh, wedding bells are ringing. Well, for one of our panelists, we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about the crazy rumors. There's three different sets of rumors from Mark Gurman, including a foldable iPhone and a little bitty Mac Pro. It's all coming up next on Mac Break Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 749, recorded Tuesday, January 19th, 2021. Animals folding pizza. This episode of Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Now you can look forward to a successful new year where you can get a new career in IT with the best IT education around. Visit itpro.tv slash macbreak for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription. Just use the code MACBREAK30 at checkout. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the show where we cover the latest news from Apple. We've got Rene Ritchie in his position there in Montreal. Rene Ritchie is on YouTube at youtube.com slash Rene Ritchie, and he is on Team Valor. <laughs> I am. I am on Team Valor. I am also not technically from Apple or of Apple in a Handmaid's Tale sort of a sense. I am just generally chatty about Apple. Chatty about Apple, not of Apple. <laughs> he, uh, Lisa was so excited. I think it was yesterday. Oh, yeah, it was great. Because you guys were in a in a thing together. What do you call those? A raid together. Raid. A raid. <laughs> yeah. Lisa was totally raid boss. <laughs> she said, Renee's in there. I said, oh, say hi to him. She said, I can't. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. This is we're talking about Pokemon Go, uh, and Andy I think and I was going. Of kids getting trolled if they chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No chatting app. allowed. You can only yeah. beat up bosses. That's it. Yes. Also, Andy Anako from WGBH in Boston. Hello, Andrew. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm I'm a Ronin, a master masterless samurai, walking the warrior's path in Edo era Japan. I know. I love that. The idea of a Ronin, it's such a great thing. Except for the fact that they tended to chop people's heads off kind of at a center. He's also a Batusai, a Himura, what is it, a Batusai, a Himura a Batusai? Batusai from the, yeah, from the Tokugawa Shogunate. Oh. That is what Andy is. Yes. Does that mean a, a, a man without a, without a shog without a, a master? There was a famous Japanese movie series and TV series called uh, Rurouni Kenshin about uh, uh, a masterless warrior, a Ronin, during the time of the Tokugawa Shogunate. Love that stuff. I was well, I, 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 that, that that's a good reference. I think that that reference is also referencing what I was referencing that was referencing, which is Usagi Yojimbo, Stan Sakai yes. comic book about a a rabbit Ronin samurai. That all of which is based on the original Akira Kurosawa movie, right? Or no? <laughs> is it the other way around? I don't it's think all, it, it's all Lone I don't Wolf think and Kurosawa Cubs, you know? did comic book movies. I think the comic book. Maybe Yoda Kurosawa. is Lone Wolf and Cub. Mm. Uh, I don't know. Well, well, if you believe the white the white academic researchers about literature, there are only like eight stories. That's true. That, that everything's copying. That's from, true. So. My my eighth grade English teacher said that. He said you got to read Homer and you got to read the Bible because then you got it all. There's nothing more. There's that salt, other famous salt, Hollywood salt thing where they said, guys, only, <laughs> they said there's only Snow White and Cinderella, and they will always buy Snow White and never buy Cinderella. Right. Sorry, they'll only buy Cinderella and yeah. never buy Sleeping Beauty. That was it. Hey, before we go uh, into the Apple news, congratulations to one of our former cohort members. As you know, Lori Gill went on, has gone on to greater things at Apple Computer. She's there uh, writing uh, scripts for their YouTube channel, but she also got married. Yes. Hey. On uh, on the seventeenth, I know she didn't invite any of us, but it was an Instagram wedding, so I guess we were all invited. Yeah. I heard well, we people are, are doing that now, so they don't have to invite their families. They're all doing COVID weddings. It's the perfect. <laughs> it's excuse. Such a great idea. So congratulations to uh, Lori and uh, her spouse. Don't know Craig. who. Craig. Yeah. Craig. Okay. Yeah. She never introduced us, but it's great. You know, if you go to her tweet about it. She's Appleholic, A P P A H O L I K. You'll see pretty much everybody we know <laughs> congratulating her. It's kind of it really. You feel like you're in the wedding party. It's all the it's all the uh, the Apple royalty royalty yeah. and the uh, Apple it's, press. It's like eloping with infrastructure. Yeah, <laughs> it's it was a full Mandalorian wedding. I understand exactly. Too. Yeah, so we're really happy for you, Lori. Congratulations to you and Craig. Uh, COVID wedding hashtag. 
like COVID and they look so cute. <laughs> they look so cute and together. She might be watching. So congratulations, Lori. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> nice. I'm sure if she's not, people will, will uh, let her know. We'll tweet at her. Uh, there is some Apple news. We last week were talking about uh, Tim Cook's appearance on CBS this morning and the speculation about the big initiative Apple was going to launch. And David Pogue said, oh, maybe they're going to start doing vaccine. Actually, it wasn't David Pogue's idea. Somebody else, Neil Seibart, I think, said. Neil Seibart, yeah. Yeah, said, oh, they're going to do vaccinations at the Apple Store. No. It's a major new racial equality and justice initiative, R-E-J-I is the abbreviation, Something Apple announced, what, almost a year ago, a while ago, that they were yeah. going to put $100 million towards it. Uh, they are now uh, talking about the specifics of it, including uh, a first-of-its-kind educational hub for historically black colleges and universities. And I love this, an Apple Developer Academy in Detroit, which is yeah. really cool. Here's yeah. a picture of the Propel Center that they're going to build. Wow. Um, that's, that's for the, uh, that's an innovation hub for the entire HBCU community, curriculum, internships, mentorship opportunities. This is Apple, uh, stepping up and doing what they said they were going to do, which is fantastic. Um, they announced it in June following the, uh, killings of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and uh, many others in the Black Lives Matter, uh, protests. So this is interesting. It is a little bit in contrast to the way Steve Jobs worked um, there were no public uh, charity, uh, charitable initiatives from Apple during his tenure. But Tim Cook has been very uh, aggressive about pursuing this. Yeah, it's it's a really great package, uh, particularly their ongoing work with Ed Farm, um, which is a, it's, it's the Ed Farm designed it, it, this beautiful Atlanta campus, the Propel Center. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they're they're also like they're they're basically it's, it's an education uh, initiative and an education program that's based in Alabama, uh, and the you you get the you get the sense that they're making the right moves here because all throughout the announcements and all throughout the news that's uh, been done after that is isn't about Apple. Uh, a big company saying, "Congratulations, we're here to instill our benevolence all over." Right. It's more like we 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 are working with uh, companies and organizations and grassroots organizations that have made it their mission their their mission not to manufacture technology and also save the world, but to specifically focus on this one problem. So they know that they they, they it's it's not enough to dump a pile of money on a problem. It needs to be put in the right directions and used effectively. Uh, and this doesn't look like, oh well, we wrote a check. And now we get to have a we get to have a photo op of holding handing a giant check off to someone, and that'll look good in the in the company report. It 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 is it is a good uh, example of focused contribution, focused uh, giving back, focused <laughs> uh, making people a little less upset that tech companies are have so much power over over our industry and over our country. Uh, it, with Apple, you know that this is kind of a, this this was a sincere effort as opposed to a way of diverting PR. <laughs> into the good column instead of into the bad column. but They put their money this. where their mouth is, is how I would put it. And that's a good yeah, thing. And, and Steve, like you said, Steve was really big on not pimping your karma. He believed that that sort of tainted it, that if you did it for recognition or if you got recognition, it mm -hmm. took away from the, the mm -hmm. sheer goodness of the act where Tim Cook seems to you know, very much feel that you can lead by example, that you can inspire others and that Apple has such a position that they can use it to, you know, and famously, I think one of the few times Tim Cook has ever been riled up in public is when people complained about Apple doing the environment and doing accessibility and doing things like this. And, and he said, I don't give a, I don't care about the bloody ROI because he, yeah. he believes that it's Apple's job to make a better, a better world. And you could say cynically that the more people that get into Apple's system and Apple sites and Apple's economy will eventually be Apple customers. But I think they really do. I think he really is like a Bobby Kennedy Malcolm uh, Luther King type who wants to you know, lay those golden bricks and make the world a better place. I, you know, yeah. they're both both tenable positions. Don't pip your karma or, on the other hand, lead by example. I think they're both tenable positions. Do we know, it, was Steve Jobs very active uh, in, in charity? I mean, he, he didn't publicize Privately, it. apparently. Yeah. yeah. His wife certainly yeah. is now. Um, Laureen uh, is doing a lot of uh, things with uh, the money she uh, inherited and uh, some of it, which, of course, is her own. Um, anyway, just thought I'd yeah, tell you what it was. 
Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it does set aside. It does set them apart from other initiatives like uh, Facebook and Google have been making big waves. But hey, we're addressing the housing problem uh, in the Bay Area and, and for lower middle income people. Uh, but <laughs> parenthetically, we, this is a problem that we actually kind of helped to create by by moving so many people into a concentrated area and driving housing and rents up so high. So yeah, there's, there's if there's if there's anyone who is kind of seriously trying to criticize this go soak your head there's no you're you're, 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 you're kind of too cynical about, about life. go soak your head and if you're calling it political please look up what that word actually means and stop using it yes. as a weapon it thank you in fact not political yeah. in any I, respect i saw yeah, yeah. i saw a couple yes. uh, i actually saw a couple commentators saying oh well of course now that the tide has turned and the election has gone uh, now that now that uh, tim cook's friend trump trump is no longer going to be in office they have to yeah well this was in the works for like months and months and months in this relationship uh, with these organizations have been going back, going, uh, going far, far beyond uh, the current political, the, the current election cycle. So again, go soak your head. Yeah. yeah. And no one in government likes big tech. They just dislike it differently. <laughs> yeah. uh, Apple, some big rumors. Uh, again, I don't like to do rumors, but this time of year, we ain't got much else. So <laughs> so we'll do them. Mark German was on let fire. Us, let this us weekend. have this. Uh, German see. was absolutely on fire this weekend. Two new Mac Pro high-end desktops, one perhaps based on Intel, much like the existing Mac Pro, another half the size. I want the cute one, the little one, and that'll be, of course, based on Apple Silicon. That's a, I think I love that rumor. I don't know how, you know. So what. I think the first part is not actually a rumor. I think the first part is, so before Apple replaced Apple said it was going to be a two-year transition going from Intel to Apple Silicon Macs. And last time, the Mac Pro and the belated XServe were the last ones. And I think it's safe to assume the Mac Pro will be the last one this right. time. And whether they get it done in a year or two years, that's a long time. And what Apple did with every other Mac is release a final Intel version before they went to the Apple Silicon version so that for people who work in jobs where they're not sure about the software compatibility or they just don't want Apple Silicon until it's like a couple of years mature, they can get the best version possible of Intel. And my guess is that's all. That's what that other Mac Pro is. It's that last Intel version that any studio can buy a bunch of if they're at all worried <laughs> and sort of get three or four, five years out of them if they have to. Yeah, I had a guy on the radio show uh, who does music production. He said, well, Pro Tools, not only does Pro Tools not run on, on the M1, yeah. it doesn't run on Big Sur. So he's, yeah. you know, <laughs> so, but th that's the way it is in the, in these, in these businesses yeah. in verticals, particularly not necessarily creatives, but, but in verticals there, there is a lag time. And so it would make sense. They didn't, German didn't say outright, they will make an Intel Mac Pro, but it does make a lot of sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, on top of everything else, you have to remember that a lot of these organizations they have to deal with certifications where they're not so they're, they don't even allow people to buy or put in purchase orders for hardware that is not on a list of of uh, hardware that has been right. determined by a different department to be suitable for purpose, and so that's why there's going to be a lag. And also, we we get really excited about the about the new hardware. We get excited also because we see we we recognize this as a turning point for Apple. Some of us get excited because we haven't bought new Macs in eight years, and we've we're super Super overdue for a new one, but you realize that this is going to be a case of, for most people, whenever their current Mac is no longer suitable for purpose in the next one, two, or three years, then they're going to replace it with what's going to be an Apple Silicon Mac. So they've, so Apple has certainly has time to to roll things out. Uh, so someone actually uh, was uh, direct messaging me uh, last night because they are asking for advice. Well, I, I I I'm tempted to replace my Intel uh, my, my 2018 Intel uh, Mac Mini and my uh, and my MacBook Air, like with a new MacBook M1, and I'm saying that, well, look, you know, you don't have to do it right now. This is the, it's it's a really good first outing, but the next outings are going to be much more suitable for people like you who are trying to combine uh, one, make one $2,500, $3,000 purchase to, to to combine all your assets into one. We still have a limit of, uh, of the memory. We still have a limit regarding the IO. Those are both going to be problems for anybody who is not trying to replace essentially a MacBook Air. Uh, if you're looking to replace 
replace a MacBook Air, go ahead. You're going to be very happy with it. But if this is going to be your 4K editing deck for the next three, four, five years, and your current editing deck is perfectly fine, uh, maybe you it will you'll be much much benefited by waiting a year or two. I can't wait for the for if there is a mini Mac Pro coming. That yes. is what I'm putting my shekels towards. That, that is that, that is a matter of fact that rumor or that concept or the correct the correctness of that that uh, idea is what kind of spurred me on to say you know what this was I was kind of on the fence about buying a somewhat underpowered again based on I.O. Uh, MacBook Pro. But given that this will be my portable Mac and I will be buying for two or three thousand dollars the really, really big, powerful desktop for all the stuff that's going to be heavy duty homebound sort of stuff. Yes. In two or three years, I will have the three thousand dollars and I will get that more than enough use out of the M1 uh, MacBook out of that. So. I'm nervous, Renee, are you I'm are you probably aren't following Intel's roadmap anymore, or are you? <laughs> yes. I, well, I mean, I'm following it sort of how somebody follows a train going off the tracks. So it's sad, but I'm still doing it. They got a new they got a new CEO, and uh, yep. uh, yeah. <laughs> Gelsinger replaces Swan. Gelsinger in for Swan, yes. who was in for Krasanich, um, yes. and uh, they said, "Well, we're going to defer the decision about our future until Gelsinger gets yeah. here next month." <laughs> Uh, you know, some people are saying, overlake. dump the fabs, You're, those yeah. are big money losers. But the real question is, if you make a Mac Pro, Intel-based Mac Pro, and it would be later this year, right? It would probably be the fall. Yeah. What Will there be an Intel Xeon that's somehow better than what they are using today? So it, only because the Xeons were so slow in updating, like I believe they were on Scott, and these are the Xeon, I forget what they call them, Xeon X. These aren't the the big iron Xeons. These are the more uh, commercial grade Xeons. And they had a special name for them, Xeon Y or Xeon X or something. Uh, and I think those were still on Skylake. So it's probably at least one generation oh, okay. they could go to. Those so they could always go to lagged. There may be an 11th generation or 10th or 11th generation yeah. Xeon. My sphere there here is that I, with with like Andy, the and like everybody, all of our wish lists, our mythical, magical Mac for the last <laughs> decade has been this X-Mac, this mini tower yeah. that we all just wanted. That would be the perfect machine for hobbyists that Apple just never made. Like the Excel sheet just never pivoted in a direction that made that cash positive. And I would love this so much. Even if it's just we yank out those Xeon chips, we yank out that gi those giant AMD cards, there's so much less space, we can shrink it down. But... It if they could, if they would do that, if they would give us a modular Mac based on a ginormous multi-core M series processor, I I don't know what I'd do, Leo. I'd take a bu bubble bath and call it a, call it okay. a day. I'd feel like okay. <laughs> it's sexy time now on Mac Break Weekly as I do a dramatic reading of Rumor. The second version, <laughs> however, <laughs> will use Apple's own processors and be less than half the wow, size wow. of the current Mac Pro. The design will feature a mostly aluminum exterior <laughs> and could invoke nostalgia for the Power Mac G4 Cube, a short-lived, smaller version of the Power Mac. It's total nerd porn. This is like nerd, nerd porn. It is the worst. I don't know if that was a sexy voice, but <laughs> it's not. I mean, people the, laugh when we keep so call ride. things sexy, but it's. But it, so I even if the, gram, baby. even if this is the, the same price as the existing Mac Pro, I could just see myself with my nose. You know, pressed Craig is looking glass. at it. He's looking at it like he was in that event. He's just he's looking at it with the red lights, and he's just oh. he's, he has it right now. Oh, <laughs> it, baby, oh man. <laughs> yeah, that would be you a dream know. machine. For, like, I don't think it was like the MacBooks will still be oh. the biggest sellers. The MacBook Air will still be the biggest seller. But for for nerd culture that yeah. has been waiting so long for it, this would be the ultimate Mac. Well, let's fantasize. If you're going to make that, it would be an M uh, series chip that would be like generations M1 down the road T or something. Yeah, it would so have. What would you do? How many article. cores? What would you do? I'm, I'm confused by his article because he said next generation. And the one thing about Bloomberg is for all their copy editors, they are incredibly imprecise. Like they kept saying magnetically charging iPhones. They connect magnetically. They charge inductively. <laughs> yeah. I cannot take their English at face it's value. Annoying. So yeah. he says next generation chipset. And I don't know if that means literally next generation as in an M2 that would be based on A15 
Silicon IP, which is a, a, an advancement on the architecture, or just like M1X has more car, cores and then M1T has more cores after that. And that's still interesting, but a very different proposition. Yeah, yeah. Also, the, we need to understand that you can't really translate more cores equals more power. I mean, it's it's kind of like in the old days where you say, oh, this has got more megahertz. So this is obviously a much better, much stronger computer. Uh, and, and for a lot of tasks, it's going to be if you, have the, if you have the choice between more cores but less RAM or more RAM and, and fewer cores, you would take the more RAM and fewer cores because you're dealing with the kind of operations where I need to be able to keep as much data actually in physical active memory as possible. And that's the speed bottleneck so um yeah i mean it you know it could just be 64 gigs of ram or 128 or 1 1.2 terabytes it could just be yeah. 18 <laughs> thunderbolt 4 <laughs> channels uh i think one thing that they're going to want to look at is gpu uh whether they use external gpus they support amd or more likely they do their own whether yeah, it's on die or off die gpus that's that's got to be an area where there's room to a lot of room to grow, right? But I feel like that's an implementation, like whether it's onboard, offboard, discrete or integrated, that's an implementation detail that I care about only so much in what they can deliver. Like if they can deliver onboard and in an SOC, something that's competitive with NVIDIA and, and Intel, sorry, not Intel, um, NVIDIA and AMD, I, I still don't know because I would like the ability to swap graphics cards. I'd like the ability to swap CPUs too. This is a whole new world, Leo. I don't know if they could make an SOC <laughs> where every year, if you want to, if you work at Pixar ILM, oh, M2 time, socket swap. M3 time, socket swap. Yeah. That to me would be ideal. And how, how they implement it, I think, is, is more their problem. By the way, I, uh, thank you to the chat room. Uh, who mentioned that Intel did, in fact, announce new CPUs at CES, new Xeons, in fact. Yeah. This is the third-generation Intel Xeon scalable processors. They're Ice Lake, they're 10 nanometer, and they're going to be uh, uh, ramping up at volume first quarter of this year. So certainly by the fall, they would have enough to make uh, Mac Pros with those. So there is, there is a part, and, uh, you know, that kind of makes sense that they would, yeah. uh, they would do that. And their 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 bread and butter is still server cores. It's still going to be a commodity cores, and still yeah. going to be the again the people who need to do to to, to uh, do a dynamic model of airflow through a manifold. Yeah. And again, that does it, that's that's you know that's who you are. Air. Yeah, yeah, you know who you are. And I wouldn't buy one, but uh, if you need one, you will you will have you probably will have something like yeah. that. Yeah, I'm much more interested. in this. In the, in the mini Mac Pro, just because yeah, it, exactly. it's going to be cute as hell, you know that, right? Especially, Mac especially Pro if Q. they just take <laughs> take whatever the Mac Pro is and just like scale it Squeeze down. It. I'm talking yes. all the way down to like Super so cute. that if I have like an action figure, if I got like my yeah. Avengers action figures, yeah. Tony Stark can have like yeah. this this cray type seating. And the wheels are only five hundred dollars each. That kind of thing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that <laughs> they actually are apparently according again German rumor, uh, working on a lower priced. Not cheap. Yes. Lower priced external monitor to sell alongside the Pro Display XDR, which is five thousand dollars before you buy the stand. The, according to German, the cheaper monitor would feature a screen geared more for consumer than professional use. Wouldn't have the brightness and contrast ratio of the top tier offering. Um, that's the one, you know. Well, that, the top tier offering is a reference monitor. This not, just has to you be don't basically that, you just yeah. have to wrap yeah. the iMac panel. Whatever you make for the next iMac, just wrap that up and give it to me as a display. I'll be fine. <laughs> so I have an iMac Pro, at which I mentioned before. I rarely turn on now. <laughs> uh, uh, will will there be an Intel iMac Pro? Do you think, or is that not? There's no market for that. No, I don't. No. Yeah, no. I don't. I, I would be surprised at this point. So they are, and this is the other part of uh, the the German rumor mill this week, uh, redesign of the uh, iMac. Again, sexy music, please. The new models will slim. Wow. I need a sexy voice. What is a sexy oh, wow. voice? Oh, baby, the new models will slim down the thick black borders around the screen. Do away with a sizable metal chin wow. area We're talking about shaft in favor wow. of a design wow. similar to apple's wow. pro wow. display wow. xdr wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah wow. these imax wow. 
We'll have a flat back. Oh, yeah, baby. Moving away from the curved rear. I do like a curved rear, but there's nothing like a flat back Mac. Apple's plenty. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> and, I, and actually, I just realized, I think I've been doing the, the match game. Like, waiting <laughs> that should be your TikTok, Leo. They should just cut. Micah should just cut that off and make that your first 10 TikToks. <laughs> we have TwitTalk. We have a TikTok. <laughs> is, is, Micah, do we do twi TwitTalk? I don't know if we are doing it, but that would be a good twit talk. I can give you a cool, a clean read for that. Apple's planning to launch two <laughs> versions, codenamed J45... J456. So originally, I wanted to do a TikTok J channel where I slow jammed Apple News, and Georgia told me no. <laughs> I said, no, you will not. No. I was just going to slow jam the Apple News. Well, what would it be? What would slow jam Apple News be like? Exactly what you just did. Oh, okay. That's it? That's a slow jam? Yeah. Four, five, it's hard, six, it's, and four, it's, five, It's hard for seven. tenors to slow jam. I'm saying you have, <laughs> you, you've, you've, achieved, you've, you've achieved the impossible before, Renee, but that's... I that's would some, be Jimmy Fallon. There's time where you want the I lush, rich rest. baritone of a... The people said, asking not to be identified. <laughs> that's right. Andy, no names. Dude, I like the match game music. Wicked Wanda was so wicked. <laughs> Every time she reached that's for a not stapler, slow jam, that's toe jam. Stick. Okay. The upcoming uh, products are part of Apple's radical overhaul of its personal computer lineup. Yeah. Which is, you know, Apple Silicon. And we had hoped that there would be new designs. Will there be new? Uh, the iMac redesign, yeah. Will there be new? Yes, we think there are going to be new uh, laptop redesigns as well, right? He did another article. He did three articles. He did that one. He did the, the MacBook Pro article. And he did the flip iPhone article. So this, this is the one that says <laughs> magnetic charging. Do you think it will be? Yeah. I think he's saying MagSafe, right? It'll have a breakaway. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's yeah. just, again, like. Not charging, uh, magnetic ten, charging yeah. cable. Um, that's so a, that's a very interesting rumor because it does uh, on the on the MacBook Pro because you always see when Apple has an idea that they know everybody loves you they will they will keep that thing on it until it stops working when something never really worked to begin with <laughs> like like a, if there was a touch bar that people were like eh okay if there was a keyboard that people were like eh okay if there was a a, a charging connector that people were like eh okay but the people who didn't like the change were never never stopped being vocal about it the next generation of hardware if none of those things appeared you know that this is there saying not mea culpa but okay okay we, we, don't, we don't we don't have to beat ourselves up about it but it turns out that we made a lot of unsafe bets three or four years ago andy you were right on that right on that also right on that let's just move on uh they he does say that the new laptops will have a new chip it won't be the m1 it'll be the next generation versions yeah of Apple's in-house Mac processors upgraded with more cores and enhanced graphics. The person said, asking not to be named. <laughs> Don't tell anybody who I am. <laughs> These devices will mark Apple's Shush. first high-end laptop. High-end is the important part here to move away from Intel. Because these these the these M1 MacBook Pros and MacBook Airs are really, as you've said a number of times, Renee, just kind of a refresh of the low end, the, yeah. the lowest end Apple laptops. Um I have to say, I'm. I don't feel like I'm using a low end machine. I feel the M1 right. is so fast that you don't. You feel like I'm. I'm in the Pro line, which makes me very excited about what the Pro line is going to offer. Yeah, when when they decide that they want to have them, the, they want to hold the mantle of un, un, unarguably the fastest desktop workstation you can buy in a, on a retail setting. Boy, we're gonna we're gonna see some big clouds of dust when when they decide that they want that title, because the 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 ceiling for this is pretty damn high with their hardware. A major change to the new computers will be how they charge. Writes Mark Gurman over the past five years, USB C. The company is now bringing back MagSafe. Um, would it be a USB C MagSafe? Yes, right. It'd have to be, or no. Well, so this is the thing, like the USB-C defines the plug and it's it's USB 3.0. And they just renamed everything. Like two weeks ago, they renamed everything as USB 3.2, making it even worse oh, to try to Lord. differentiate them. <laughs> like 3.0, 3.1, and 3.2 are all 3.2 of some variety now. It's it's appalling. I like but having the USB the, the USB 3.2, nay, siege things, to be can be charging or for data. 
Yes. But same. now it sounds like they're going to have a charging port that's distinct. Yes. Which will be yeah. on the wrong side every time I want to use it, yeah. like it used to be. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if I think that's the right way to go. Because they could do a breakaway USB 3.2 Type-C thing, right? They could just have a breakaway. I think there's third-party things like or that. Or maybe make a puck and let me attach it magnetically to any part of the Mac. Oh, you know, just that's slap, an slap, interesting slap, one. Slap, slap. No, inductive <laughs> charging is not fast enough for a 100-watt device, no. I don't think. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are there are some phone companies that go really ludicrously fast, but what they do is they separate the battery out independently and then charge each part of the separate battery, thereby yeah. reducing the total health and the total volume of the battery, right. but they can advertise a real fast charging speed. Right. I don't think that's yeah. worth it. Yeah. Apple's also planning, says Goyman, a redesigned MacBook Air, but that's not expected to be released until long after the next MacBook Pros. Also, the touch bar... Apple's tested versions that remove the touch bar from its laptop keyboards. Yeah. Tested. And Ming-Chi Guo said it's going away. Well, Guo, sorry, Guo Ming-Chi said that it's going away completely. As he, he thinks they're getting rid of it. My thing is that regardless of how you feel, whether you love it or hate it, Apple announced it in 2016 and has promptly done nothing with it. They've not advanced it, yeah. not iterated it. It hasn't gone to any more computers, not available on desktops. They haven't added haptics to it at all. It's just stuck there, and that does not seem like a technology Apple's engaged with. It felt like it's it was maybe a, for the Mac. a stealth way to get the ARM chips into the uh, Intel Macs, the T1 and later T2 chips into the Intel Macs, uh, and now they don't need it anymore. So my understanding is it started off because they wanted to put Touch ID in and they had to put right. what was essentially an S2 chip at the time. And they were concerned about security. So they wanted a discrete display exactly. for the price so, so nobody could try to hack the price that you were agreeing to. And then it sort of escalated from there yeah. until we got a whole bar. <laughs> it's, it's, le it's, it's time is, is gone. It's done. It's over. Third article, Apple preps next Mac chips with AIM. To outclass top-end PCs. I should point out, Mark almost certainly does not write his own headlines. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> no. Somebody at Bloomberg does that. Um, faster performing than Intel's best. I, love, I do love hearing stuff like that. They kind of are already, though. I mean, it was only the very latest Ryzen 3 that were core, like single-core performance competitive with the M1. Yeah. So it's not it's not a high bar. <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean there are things like there are certain tasks that the Intel chips. Like some people still prefer Intel to AMD for gaming for very specific reasons, but uh, in in general, Apple's doing really really good architecture. Yeah, I, actually that wasn't the third. That was that was uh, an older the iPhone Flip. The iPhone Flip. Oh, tell me yeah. about that. What's the iPhone Flip? So he and John Prosser both put out stories this week. Uh, originally, Apple, and for years, they were working on a two-screen foldable version. And now they're both talking about Apple working on using Samsung-style foldable uh foldable display technology to either make something like the Galaxy Fold or in John and Mark's more recent articles, something like the Flip that would open up into a iPhone 12 Pro Max style device. And the reason I like this so much is, well, beyond the fact that we're human, we fold everything. We fold wallets, we fold, you know, pizza, we fold <laughs> sandwiches, we fold clothing. Only we animals like, fold pizza, I want to say. Yes. Okay. No, uh, the other way around. Only animals don't, don't fold, fold pizza. All right, I'm confused. If you're in New York. You gotta, <laughs> but the thing that's nice about this is that Apple has built this infrastructure for their software. <clears throat> Excuse me. Like one of the biggest problems with the foldables on the Android side is that Google is having to work hand in hand with every manufacturer to fit every different screen size and model and transition. And the app developers haven't done a lot. And there's really a paucity of tablet apps where Apple from the Apple Watch interface and App Store to iPad OS and that huge catalog of iPad apps, they really can use size classes and auto layout to propel you through different size of app experiences. So if it's like an Apple Pocket Watch where it looks like the little Apple Watch interface on the outside and then you open it up and you have the iPhone interface or an iPhone where you open it up and suddenly you have the iPad version of every app except for Instagram because they still haven't made it, that to me is like would be a really, really good software experience. They could just focus on the hardware from there. The, according to German, they're not yet testing uh, phones. They're, they're really still at the screen stage. And I have to say, you know, I have a, this is the Galaxy Fold. Although the flip, I have to say the flip to me does, and they're I've nice. talked to people who said, that's, that's really the form factor you want. This gives you a tablet-sized 
almost a tablet size uh, yeah. screen. Some people when you want that it. though. I don't, but I'd the like issue, that. and I've seen a number of people complaining about broken screens. The issue at this point is, can you make this fold uh, reliable, durable? Uh, invisible enough. Oh, I mean, I see. Mark it. says they're going to use the, the that Apple's new shatter technology, their ceramic, um, oh, what do they call it, shield, their ceramic shield technology for that, and which that's is interesting flexible. because Apple does get the OLED process from Samsung, but they don't use Samsung panels. They sometimes ask for their own materials. They do all of their yeah. own display work after they get those. So Samsung, I forget who makes theirs. It's a different company than Corning, but Apple and Corning are apparently working on a new kind of ceramic shield for it. I like the uh, Z, the Z Flip. I think that's a that that would actually kind of make sense. Part of the problem Apple has is it's just there's there's nothing new in the iPhone, so they need they need to do something to to do something at least that's a little different. Whether it's Kirk whether to it's Enterprise necessary, yeah. Whether yeah. it's necessary may be secondary to the idea that we just need to have to we just got to do something that's not a slab of glass. I like yeah. the the idea. I haven't. Maybe I should trade in this uh, fold for the flip and see if I. You can get more it, money back. I saw people ordering Amazon renewed versions of iPhones and other things to trade into Samsung, getting more money than they paid for it to wow. get like the latest S twenty one and yeah. the Galaxy Fold for almost no money. Uh, Samsung's really trying to push this market, and this is a good time to try to get into it. I ordered the flip yeah. when it first came out, but uh, it took so long I canceled. Eh, maybe I should. It might yeah. be interesting. It really is a great form factor I'll, I'll, because it, it's, I love the, the idea of a, a device that adapts to whatever your immediate situation is. Uh, as you say, not just having something that's more pocketable that turns into something that's more like a tablet or uh, a standard size uh, iPhone Pro, but also imagine the idea of, it, of uh, the screen folding backwards like 300 degrees and being something like a desk clock. That will give you notifications, give you messages, give you that what that really cool uh, uh, complication-based uh, interface for uh, for Apple Watch sort of uh, clock designs, but also give you interactivity, or even give you an extra control surface that uh, the Touch Bar on your Mac uh, doesn't really sort of deliver. So there, and given that most of the problems that Samsung has been having have been real bread and butter nuts and bolts engineering problems like how do you design a hinge that rem that remains that, that remains a barrier against dust and it's, it's a really complicated like watchmaker type of mechanism in order to make that work that's the sort of stuff that's really up apple's alley to design solutions like that and uh, and i also agree with the idea that as soon as as soon as there is a, a a foldable glass solution as opposed to a foldable plastic solution that's when apple really gets interested in this yeah yeah that's the problem. It really feels a little plasticky uh, on, the, on yeah. the fold. It's, just kind of, I, 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 it's a weird yeah. experience, or almost even a little rubbery. It's kind of sticky. Yeah, it's it's. I think that's non-negotiable for so many reasons. Yeah, and and I it's agree. and it's, it's it's on the horizon. It's it's not going to be a, a cheap phone, but it's possible to get foldable glass in quantities where <laughs> in experimental quantities right now, as opposed to enough quantities that people who want expensive iPhones can all get one. Maybe not. But it's supposed to be pen durable this time, right? Like it's supposed to be at least durable enough for the pen. And then it's yeah. it's balancing out the durability versus the fragility versus the radius that you can fold it. Because apparently the stronger panels don't fold quite as nicely as the weaker panels. Mm. I love Mark Kerman's uh, rumors, I must say. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> At least we're all agreed that just like, just like there are people who agree that folding pizza is okay, there are people who don't see it. I think we all agree that folding the pizza <laughs> so that the sauce and the toppings are on the outside is absolutely the wrong That's idea. Out. That's right. Out. I, I, think, yes. I think we all seem to have agreed that yeah. having the display on the outside is yeah. was a, a great demo three or four years ago. Definitely not what we actually want. Well, but that's one problem with the, the uh, Microsoft at, Duo is there is there it's a blank face. When it's closed, yeah. and it is nice, and this this is the 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 display on the on the fold two is big enough that yeah, I mean it's nice. a little weird, but it's at least big enough to see what's going on. You can you can use it. You could use it as a phone this way. So you do need something. I don't know. It's it's tricksy. No. It's difficult. Foldable, let's yes. You're you're breaking up. You're breaking you up. up your Say, do it again. Say it again. Whatever you just oh. said. 
you see the, the TLC rollables at CES yes. where they yeah. eat gold out and there's like a giant scroll you can cast your spells? So TCL had a phone that weirdly grew. <laughs> it just was weird yeah. looking. LG too. Yeah. <laughs> and then LG, LG actually and is going to make one. Yeah. TCL's was a concept. And then the scroll looked like an Egyptian scroll that you... Uh, nobody has announced they're making that yet, but it's in, it is interesting it's like to see. Like power word kill and watch the watch the earth burn in front of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But th that but that is a ridiculous concept. If it's the idea that because <laughs> you can't just simply pull it out, you it's a it motor a motor has to push it out, and you have to simply wait while it goes click, and suddenly you know, suddenly your, your your phone is just a little bit wider. Yeah, it's, it's like so weird. okay, <laughs> and 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 the fact they didn't actually have a working anything showing off, they just had a prop that they <laughs> projected, they they inserted some video from the uh, from their keynote presentation onto, and oh well afterwards. We're saying yes. We're absolutely going to manufacture and ship this. Is there a name? Not really. Is there a ship? We're going to call it the. Uh, we're going to call it the grower, yeah. not a shower phone. L LG did, did it? ship the wing though, so they'll okay. do it. <laughs> LG is just crazy enough to do it. Yeah, the wing is weird. Jason Howell reviewed it. I I don't I don't get it. So the <laughs> idea like is it'll be an iPhone Pro Max size. This is according to German Pro Max yeah. size screen folded in half, so it's a little pot, yeah. little small. I kind of like that. If you can make the screen reliable and exactly as you said, Andy, feels like glass, the hinge is not uh, weird looking, yeah, I can go for that. And I guess there have been enough of these out now that that's probably the case that these are the, oh, for Samsung a, a, lot, a, a lot of the early grunt work has definitely been done yeah. also Apple's in a really good position to do this because Apple's market is full of not just early adopters but what I call I keep calling early believers yeah. people that if they know they know that if Apple's putting it out it's not ha it's it, it may not be completely fully baked but it's not half baked it's usable with for people who accept that they're on the first generation of something that's going to get better uh, as time goes by and people who have deep pockets who really would not flinch at the idea of spending iPad Pro money on a uh, iPhone Pro that folds. Yeah. So this is they, they could really push things forward and not just in terms of pushing the technology forward, but also the more people see people like at the uh, uh, on an airplane uh, at a terminal uh, in an office with a folding phone, the more they think, "Ooh, I, that actually works. That isn't yeah. just stupid like that yeah. CES demo that I saw in 2021. So. Let's take a little break. Andy Anako, Renee Ritchie, Leo Laporte. It's Mac Break Weekly, our weekly dive into Apple and Mark Gurman and, uh, <laughs> and Guo Ming Chi. Uh, our show today brought to you by IT Pro TV. New year, amazing opportunities, right? I'll tell you one thing if you're looking for work, one area that is growing constantly, even during quarantine, especially during quarantine, is IT. IT means a lot of things, though. It could be desktop support. It could be security. It could be sysadmin. It could be network administration. If you want to get into IT, one of the things you're going to have to do is decide, well, what area of IT? Can I recommend IT Pro TV? They've got exactly what you need to get started on the right foot in your IT education journey. Professional, entertaining. I don't, want, I don't mean goofy. I mean engaging. I think engaging might be a better word than entertaining. These guys are IT pros, of course, but they also know how to make it interesting, engaging. And you don't have to leave your house. You can watch it on your computer. You can watch it on your phone. You could watch it on your big screen TV. They have Roku and Apple TV and Fire TV apps, apps on every platform. This is a great month to get started in IT. It's getting started in IT month at IT Pro TV. If you're going to start a new career in the IT industry, you can catch two webinars for budding IT pros. There's a free training weekend with five courses available at no charge. Tons of videos free on their YouTube channel as well, all about starting a new career. Give you a great idea of what options there are, what areas you should look at. Now, if you're a business and you've got an IT team, IT Pro TV is great for keeping them up to date on the latest technologies, training them in new areas. It's a it's a plan your team will actually use. There's a personal plan that'll help you accelerate your IT career. Really, IT Pro TV is a one-stop shop for IT education. Microsoft, Cisco, Apple, Linux. They're the official video training partner for CompTIA. They've got all these top CompTIA courses. This is, for many people, those are the first certs you get, the ones you get to put a get your foot in the door in, a, in an IT department, A+, plus or Security+, plus or Network+. Plus. 
And that's just part of the incredible library at IT Pro TV. And one of the reasons they do so much stuff is that the stuff changes constantly. New versions of software come out. Uh, the tests change. The uh, concepts change. So they're always keeping it up to date. More than 5,800 hours now of up-to-date IT training. Nobody's got that. One of their learning co coaches can help you if you want to figure out what your future is. They can guide you on your career path. And, of course, they have great job resources, too, to help you get that IT job. One more thing I want to give them a big plug for TechNado. That's Don Pizzette. He's one of the founders, Don and Tim. Don Pizzette has a, a podcast called TechNado. Great way to kind of keep up on IT. There's industry guests, IT news recaps. Uh, everybody should be subscribing to that. That's absolutely free. So let's look forward to a successful New Year, what do you say? With a new career in IT and the best IT education around, we know these guys so well. We've been with them since the very beginning, and it's been great to watch their success and growth. ITPro.tv slash MacBreak. we got a deal, too, for you. For If you're looking at a consumer subscription, 30% off forever. As long as you stay active, 30% off if you use the offer code MacBreak30. MacBreak30. An additional 30% off the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV. Build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. I invite you uh, to visit them at itpro.tv slash MacBreak. We thank them so much for their ongoing, the long-term support of everything we do here at Twit. And you can you can show your support for MacBreak uh, weekly by using that uh, code MacBreak30 at itpro.tv slash MacBreak. Thank you, IT Pro TV. Good Good job. Good job. Uh, all right. Moving on from the rumor mill into the real world. <laughs> Actually, maybe it's... I've had, I've, I haven't had a whole here. lot of luck in the real world of the past year. Yeah, Can maybe let's stay, stay in fantasy land. Let's stay in fantasy land. The information says Apple is planning a podcasting subscription service, looking at what Spotify's doing but they also caution that apple looks at a lot of things doesn't mean they're going to do it yes everything <laughs> every thousand no's for every yes yeah what do you think are we auditioning leo should i sit up straight you know lisa <laughs> said we should call them i said the apple's never they don't want what we do that's not the kind of thing they'll do uh, in fact i wonder if they'd even do technology podcasting the hot topic now in podcasting anyway is you know these true crime and yeah. Kind of fiction shows, suspense shows, that kind of or thing. Or like the Jake Paul techy. and Joe Rogan podcasts. Yeah. Ugh. I mean that's Jake Paul's yeah, Logan it, Paul. That is yeah, that is Joe part Rogan. of the problem. Like you 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 have to hook up your you have to hook up your wagon to people who are getting huge audiences, oftentimes because they're dealing with very, very fiery content, let's say. Uh, and you're kind of Yeah, like, I have to like, think Spotify's that. saying, geez, that Joe Rogan deal, was that a good deal? Should we have gone there? And Joe Rogan yeah, might be saying that. Yeah, well, he got a hundred yeah. million dollars. I don't think he's gonna. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he's got any. He's got Howard Stern money. He's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of watches. But no, you're right. And Apple is he is very very cautious about their reputation, right? As as much yes. so as Disney. Brand image. Yeah. So that that is a challenge. Yeah, it would be interesting if they decided to produce their own podcast, though. Like, what if they decided to do their own newscast, to do their own arts channel, uh, to as a complement to all the other stuff that they're all the other stuff that they're doing with content creation? Now that they have a studio for doing TV and movies, they could have they could set up a radio studio and simply say, "We have an idea for a twelve part radio documentary," or "We have an idea for a season long." We're we're gonna buy the rights to uh, Neil Gaiman's uh, next book and turn that into a fully produced twenty two episode yes. audio series. That's much more likely. The Apple TV Plus model, except it's audio. I think that's yeah. exactly so what they're My only do. worry, my only concern is that they'll do not that. Like they'll buy Neil Gaiman's book, they'll make that into a TV Plus series, <laughs> and then pay Neil Gaiman to host a podcast about it. Like the podcast that they were doing for HBO does a lot of those. They had a Watchmen yeah. podcast, yeah, yeah. and they had a, yeah. um, what was the, a Chernobyl podcast with Craig Mazin, and they, they have so much content already, they don't bother to podcast really well. Like they have so many music centric interviews and things that they're only starting to sort of get up to speed with podcasts. But I think they will, they will look at it as, well, I guess it depends on who they get to run it, but my guess is it'll stay with Eddie Q's uh, media division and they will do it very much like, like other entertainment brands yeah. have done it. 
That makes it won't sense. be like the, the podcast nerds inside Apple who get to run it, sadly. <laughs> uh, Apple has tried to set aside the half billion dollar Vernet X uh, judgment uh, and failed. Uh, they now, given you add interest and royalties, the total payout, uh, two lawsuits could be over a billion dollars. Um, on Friday, a judge in Tyler, Texas, the home of so many of these <laughs> lawsuits, rejected Apple's request for a new trial and several other claims. Um, they, uh, they, Apple said that Vernex's, Vernet X's award should not exceed $113.7 million. Don't know where they got that from. And that jurors should have been told that the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office had deemed Vernet X's claims unpatentable. Yeah, that might have helped them in their decision. Um, so anyway, but this is this is exactly what happens uh, in these cases in uh, in uh, is it East Texas? I think it's yeah the rocket eastern docket. Easter, the rocket docket Eastern District of Texas. So you know it's not like Apple can't afford it, but it's kind of annoying. It's annoying. You, get, you you yeah you can't negotiate. You have to make you have to make sure that anybody comes after you. They're going to have to actually take this to court. They're actually going to have to. Yeah. They're not going to get a quick payoff, or else. I, I think that in the long run, this is even if they have to occasionally write a check, it's going to be better for them in the long run. Just in terms it. of yeah. You know. Apple is being also sued by a group <laughs> who said, "Hey, you cut off Parler. You should curb Telegram too." Yeah. Um. Okay. Well, this is They're very this, different this, this, apps. This. Like Parler's problem was the lack of like again, Apple. Like people are, I don't know, lying is the wrong word, but Apple said you need content moderation, and Twitter and Facebook have shown that you don't even need good content moderation. Just something. You just have Anything. to show them that you have Make a plan. An attempt. Yeah, and they <laughs> yeah. couldn't do that. Right. Telegram is not a public forum. Like a like you, you can't just go online and go to Telegram and see a bunch of posts. It's a messaging service. It's completely different in kind. You can argue it's got malicious content, but it is nothing like. Like, I keep saying parlay because I live in Montreal, but it's nothing like parlor. <laughs> but that's the yeah, problem. Of that's the door you open when you, when you do start doing this. Uh, the lawsuit was filed by the Coalition for a Safer Web, a nonpartisan <laughs> group that advocates for technologies and policies to remove extremist content from social media. The uh, president, Mark Ginsburg, is a former U.S. ambassador to Morocco. They complained about Telegram's role in hosting white supremacist, neo-Nazi, and other hateful content, and that's kind of the nature of Telegram. You can create uh, groups. Nature rooms. of the internet, like they, they're the finding the these internet. people in like yeah. like uh, what is it? High school sports forums. They're just going everywhere they can to try to to try to hide and get around this. And the other issue with par I'm going to say Parlay again, Parler, like they had zero opsec, they had zero security. You could get every post deleted or otherwise just by incrementing the post count by one. And now I believe they're being hosted on Russian servers. So like there were issues with it beyond like there were so no. many issues with it. In fact, Ben Thompson made an excellent point. He said this is this is not this is just the market saying as the market can and often does. We don't want to do you know, we it's, we don't want to do business yeah. with these guys. So, you know, you go somewhere else. That's the that's yeah. that's called a free market. But it it I think that yeah I think that the Apple doesn't have the same sort of situation with Telegram as it did with Parler. I, I, as as Renee said, the biggest problem wasn't so much that there was radical content being put on that site, but that they were being warned and approached by Apple. Uh, and, and other providers saying, "Hey, look, this is a problem. Take this down, or take it, to, uh, cl uh, clean up after your after your dogs here." And getting absolutely ghosted by them, and they really had no nothing else to do, uh, nothing else that they could possibly do. Th however, this is going to open up a new conversation in 2021 and beyond about what responsibility does an app store have, does uh, Amazon Web Services and other cloud uh, cloud software providers have to. Uh, Make sure that the con make sure that they're not enabling. Just to note one example, a huge uh, command and control infrastructure for a radical terrorist domestic terrorist group. At what point are, is our is uh, our congressional regulators going to say it is part of your responsibility to? I know that I know that you are the privacy company, but this is this is their this this could be their way of saying this is why we are arguing that you should not have end-to-end -end encryption because you yourselves are going to be made responsible for any damages to body or property that happen as a result of private communications upon your network. If that's what you want to happen, then great, hold on to your end-to-end -end encryption. Otherwise, give us a backdoor and let us police it for you. So this is it's. 
it's a long conversation that is probably going to be had. I hope it doesn't result in bad decisions and bad laws being made. But this is part of a very long decision. This is like Vatican II almost, a long, long process of evaluating. Here is how we've decided to regulate technology for the past 20 or 30 years. How should we continue to operate to, to, to allow technology to operate in the next 20 or 30 years? Or is there something are there things that were great ideas in the mid 90s that are now proven to be not the, in the best interests of our society? Or are there some things that are like the First Amendment, they're just sacrosanct, we're just going to have to work with them. So these are conversations that we're just going to have. It's also they're also protected by Section 230. Uh, and, yeah. you know, as as we've mentioned so many times, Section 230 is a very important part of the Communications Decency Act that gives us, I should say, you know, we're, we're protected by 230 as well, immunity from lawsuits over content posted by other people on our chat room and in, in uh, co comment sections on our forums. Uh, Apple has kind of that protection as well. They're not responsible for the stuff that's on Telegram any more than the phone company is responsible. So does Parler. Yeah. The, but Apple does say, and it's well, interesting, no. Apple does have a rule, um, you know, in their app store uh, that there has to be, well, I'll, I'll, read, I'll read what the Washington Post said. Um, Apple has to have a method for filtering inappropriate content out. It has yeah. to have a way for users to report it. Uh, they also have to provide contact information and have the ability to block abusive users from the service. Telegram meets all those standards. Parler never could, yes. never did. Uh, so in this, in this, pointing out, go ahead. It's also worth pointing out that these are uniquely American things. Both of both Section oh, Two Thirty yes. and freedom of like the freedom of speech. The, the way that government cannot impose censorship are uniquely American. And we're seeing now internationally, especially in the EU, Poland recently, especially Poland recently, are getting incredibly angry about yeah. that situation. Yeah. Like the U.S. has become a safe haven for social networks because of these unique protections that they're providing. And the EU is on the verge of, of – they've already, I think, passed it. They're on the verge of implementing rules that are going to make the world almost split in half uh, between between those two states. We There's a great conversation uh, on our uh, Twitter forums uh www.twit community uh as part of the conversation after last sunday's twit about because i had said the first amendment is relatively unique but other yeah. countries do have some kind of laws like that uh, uh, uh jamzy said the uk has the human rights act quote everyone has the right to freedom of expression this right shall include freedom to hold opinions and receive and impart information and ideas without interference by public authority and regardless of frontiers. So <coughs> there is there are some First Amendment like rules in other countries. But we often also have hate speech laws, which would contradict, which would not be allowed under well, the U.S. Right. Constitution. This, that, in fact, is exactly what the Human Rights Act says. The exercise of these freedoms as it carries with it duties and responsibilities may be subject to. Such formalities, conditions, restrictions, or penalties as are prescribed by law and are necessary in a democratic yes. society. And that's Whereas exactly... Whereas yours says Congress shall make no law, make right? No that's law. how you're starting exactly. to make. Exactly. And that's the exact difference. And, and it, Angela Merkel in Germany and uh, Emmanuel Macron yes. in France, many others have said, why don't they have a law? <laughs> Excuse yeah. me. There ought to be a law. Country. Why don't you guys have a law? And we, That's the First yeah. Amendment. It protects against that. Sorry about that. I, that's okay. Yeah, no, they, 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 some people misunderstood when they said they didn't think that Twitter should be in the habit of banning politicians or should have the ability to ban politicians because they believe the government should have done that long ago. And that's a completely different yeah. kettle of bees that they're yeah. opening there. In Germany, uh, uh, Big D, who's a Brit living in Germany, also regular on our community forums, says it doesn't, in Germany, it doesn't stop you from saying what you want in private. <laughs> Yeah. No, that would be hard to do, <laughs> but you can't promote hatred or violence in public, including raci racism, racial hatred, incitement of violence or murder. And I think that the First Amendment does not prevent laws against those things. You, you know, there are laws against hate speech. Well, there's libel laws, there's slander laws. Yeah. In Germany, I believe you still you still can't display Nazi paraphernalia no, and can't. the equivalent in the U.S. of not being allowed to show Confederate paraphernalia for for example, would not, I don't think that's workable under U.S. Yeah, law. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting, this is, this is a conversation that's been going on nationwide in the U.S. since, uh, <laughs> since the Capitol uh, insurrection.
can I be frank, Leo? It's, it's so confusing people outside the U.S. because it seems like in the U.S. all this stuff is so flexible. It's like we believe in freedom of speech, and if you don't give it to us, we're going to nationalize your company. Yeah. And like that's a really hard mental it's model bizarre. to get your head it's, around. You know what? Even even we can't figure it out. We're, we're <laughs> as puzzled as anybody. Um, hey, here's some good news. Smartwatches may be able to detect. I should actually get. I, I wish there were an app for this. COVID nineteen days before symptoms appear. Uh, this is a, a study from Mount Sinai. They found the Apple Watch. It's actually the heart rate variability thing. The Apple Watch can detect subtle changes in an individual's heartbeat, which can signal the individual has coronavirus up to seven days before they feel sick or even infection is de detected through testing. Uh, it's uh, heart rate variability is apparently can be a marker for infection. So it's not that it's an elevated heart rate. Heart rate variability is merely the time between heart beats, which should vary quite a bit, right? <clears throat> and it can be used as a measure not only of your overall fitness or your, some, some of these apps call it readiness, uh, but it's also a measure of how well your immune system is working. Yeah, that's a it's a big set of opportunities. I think in December, maybe it might have been even earlier than that. There was an academic paper re released about how there's an a about building an AI model that can detect the difference between a, a regular cough and a COVID cough. Uh, and the idea of I need that right to, now. Actually, can we get that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, uh, again, wouldn't that, wouldn't that be interesting? Give, given that there's so much people who are doing conversa that are having conversations through a digital medium to begin with, what if there were a plug-in uh, in Skype, a plug-in through yeah. uh, all these different apps? That sounds that like said, a COVID Yeah, <laughs> just direct message to you. Here's an, here's where you can get tested. <laughs> this has not been peer reviewed, been but tested. the thing is, perhaps yeah. So there's a lot of research on this. The the way the Mount Sinai did it, they did not do it with the help of Apple. They just had uh, a, a few hundred of their employees wear Apple watches and uh, analyze the data. <coughs> yeah. this, this, this has always been one of, the, one of the golden dreams of of all these devices collecting so much data and the that data being able to be anonymized and opt into uh, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning research studies to try to see if there is if if there is a correlation that uh, the correlation and causation sort of thing. If we can find with a large enough sample thing, people that, of whom this sort of an aberration has been detected, most of them have been later on diagnosed with this sort of disease. That's a very very dangerous road to go down but that's always been the dream that not that uh i'm i my my disease has been detected because i'm close to death my, my symptoms are now so bad that it is unquestionable what the diagnosis is but that there is a indication that you're going to develop this disease in the next year or two or that you're at the first uh the, the starting line of this disease and early treatment can possibly prolong or even save your life that's if there's one thing that will get people to uh, hand over personal data to a faceless mega tech corporation. It's the idea of you see this watch, it will it will prevent you from dying at 53, just like your aunts and uncles tend to do. Yeah. Unfortunately, there isn't yet an app to do this on any device. Um, Stanford used uh, Fitbits, Apple watches and others, Garmin watches, found that 81 yeah. percent of coronavirus positive participants experienced change in their resting heart rates up to nine and a half days prior to the onset of symptoms. An extremely elevated heart rate was indicative of symptom onset. It so basically again, these are symptoms that, that we don't, you know, that we're not normally monitoring. So these are early symptoms. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, not at all. Uh, I'm sorry. My timing's a little bit off with the, with the Skype delay. <laughs> but it makes sense when you look at Tim Cook's statement about through the long arc of history, Apple will be best remembered for their contribution to healthcare because once all this stuff is in place and we've handled like all of the pesky interpersonal communications and video game needs, we can start really focusing on how those sensors can be better, more personally and closer deployed and not to be negative about it. But as we're surpassing, like, I, I think we're close to half of what is it, half a million deaths in North America now or what? Yeah. some ridiculous number. Um, that sort of stuff will be critically important because 100 years is even short between pandemics, but there are a lot of things that are going to be going on and our ability, like Andy said, to detect those things, even if they're not lethal, but, even, but if they're just slightly, if they make you live uncomfortably 
for 30 years. If we can fix that sort of stuff, like if the Apple Watch or the Fitbit can say the way you're walking right now is going to lead to hip problems when you're in your 60s and it's really easy to fix <laughs> now, we're going to have you on a walking program. That sort of stuff will will really change a lot of lives. Yeah, and it's it's uh, it should be part of a comprehensive health management uh, system inside the entire country. If we had the ability that everybody had, everybody who needed access to an inexpensive form of healthcare, not invasive surgery, but hey, this look, this looks kind of odd. I would like to get this checked out. If that were an easy hundred bucks or easy fifty bucks for anybody in this country, uh, and we were having we had enough medical infrastructure to support it, that would save lots of lives. Without this comprehensive sort of idea, we can't have wealthy people who can afford uh, three or four hundred dollar watches every time that they've got a, a ping on their watch saying hey here's uh, here is an alert that gosh maybe you want to get your your lungs checked for something and it's based on not necessarily voodoo science but stuff that it has by no means been proven as this is an important enough signal that yes we need you to is that yes you should uh, uh put some demands upon the limited medical resources of your community to get this checked out we can't have thousands and thousands of people coming in on the off chance that this indicator is an indicator of something and that this uh, that, that a check from a doctor can actually get something done we're already we're, we've seen that what happens when we we a lot of us never really thought about the idea of our medical infrastructure being stretched stretched past the limit, and we're seeing this even one almost a full calendar year after the declaration of of a pandemic. There are still ER room. There, there's still Mass General Hospital. Uh, a doctor there just tweeted last week. It really just went right into my heart, saying that we don't have any we don't have any beds in ICU. We don't have any beds in the British nice. General Hospital. Nice. We don't have any beds in emergency. We have no place to deal with anybody right now, and think because our patients just keep coming in and coming in. So this is uh, this is part of the conversation that it's wonderful to have this this demonstration of, and because of this irregularity detected in a heartbeat, we were able to detect this person person's uh, possibility of having a stroke in the next year, we can't have thousands and tens of thousands of people who are functionally very, very healthy coming in for expensive and really, really pro protracted uh, uh, tests uh, that and it makes it more difficult for someone who is having legitimate breathing problems from getting to see a doctor and getting the attention that he or she needs. Andy Anako, WGBH Boston, Renee Ritchie. Uh, from YouTube fame of YouTube fame, <laughs> <laughs> pretty pictures are next. Let's see. Here's uh, the it came out today. The new shot on iPhone 12, portraits, cityscapes, the night sky, and more. Oh, these are beautiful shots. So good. I I always feel bad when I see these because I can't get these quality shots. You are, could do this. Later. <clears throat> so here's one thing. When we <laughs> talked about this during the Apple event uh, last September. Is are are people allowed to use external lighting with these shots? Are they doing big elaborate lighting setups uh, with these shots? Or is... for the Apple events, they're straight from camera. They they okay. do that deliberately because they never. A couple of vendors got caught severely faking that kind of stuff, and right. nobody ever wants to yeah. be in that sort of a situation. So they make really sure that it's straight from camera. This stuff, though, I think the, the, the it had to be captured with the iPhone. These are. These are not Apple artists. These are people who posted these images right. publicly. But what we don't know is if the in this picture, which is beautiful, uh, from Kuwait, a uh, guy, uh, Shepherds, I guess, sitting at a fire. There's a beautiful night sky. Well, we don't know if there might be another light in that fire or a light off. <laughs> well, also, one thing I found out because people complained and I had to look into it is that these photos don't say where they're from. They say where the, photo where the photographer lives. So ah. like a bunch of, that's not Kuwait. That's not Kuwait either. Like, oh, no, no, it's where the photographer lives. Interesting. So that's where Abdullah Shaji, who took the picture, lives. Yes. We don't know where the picture is uh, is yeah. from. Uh, here <clears throat> is one from uh, Neil Kumar, who is in the United States. I don't know where this is. Looks like it might be Philadelphia. I'm not sure. Uh, but that's a pretty pretty picture of a puddle and some row houses. Um, you know, these are. I guess the point is these are as good as. Professional pictures taken with five thousand uh, dollar DSLRs. There's no no way to look at this and say, "Oh no, this is one from an iPhone Mini," which is yeah. kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, it's, it's it's important to keep it in context that that like the one that you ju were just showing about the kid who's silhouetted against the red that is an, a t on, on a technical level that is an amazing demonstration of how it was able to pull shadow detail uh, from the the flowers in that basket mm -hmm. and also contain details in a very very super saturated red. That said. Uh, we're we're dealing with people that we're, these are photographers who know how light works and know what makes a good picture. I had a, on on Instagram somebody uh, I did a selfie mm -hmm. on Fourth of July that came out really really nice, and I just uh, as as usual I just mentioned oh taken with my uh, Pixel version one like a four or five year old camera like oh my god that was taken with a Pixel one and my only my only response was there is uh, there is a, a an adequate a merely adequate quit camera. Uh, a picture taken with a merely adequate camera, one one half hour for forty five minutes before sunset, is will be will outperform any almost any other camera under any other condition. So it's it's uh, it's important to make sure that you see the information that's being conveyed in the shot. Like again, a big big bright fire on the uh, in the at the bottom of the picture, and yet it's getting it's reading stars from the top of the picture, but not thinking that the next time you just take random shots at your kid's birthday party, the next time you take a picture. Uh, uh, at, you take a picture of a uh, of your of your partner in front of the Eiffel Tower with the sun behind them, and they're, and on a cloudy over on uh, on a sunny day, it's not going to magically turn this into a magically wonderful yeah, picture. But yeah. it, it, that's why it's important to analyze these pictures and sh and really show what they're actually being demonstrating. And I apologize if you're uh, you know the, the the pictures you're seeing. <laughs> If you're watching the video are so highly compressed that you're not seeing, go to apple.com slash newsroom and yep. you can see the actual pictures. The other thing I would point out, this is clearly, well, maybe not, but uh, this is a picture from uh, Italy. It looks very much like it was post-processed uh, with a high dynamic range. Oh, I'm sure. Filter. They, they, so, well, even even yeah. not, they could have just gone into like, you know, the, the photos app and pressed a couple buttons. Yeah. Them. yeah Vibrant exactly. filter reply. Right. Right. <laughs> That's the other thing. You, you, any, almost any picture taken with like, uh, and just do 15 seconds of pushing sliders around in whatever the standard app is to to make it exactly to your liking. Because no, no, no cyber eye is going to be as good as the human eye at figuring out that. Oh, I actually want this. This actually should be a little bit warmer. I wish there were more detail here. I was. It was so. It was so funny. I, I want to give. I want to use this as an as an excuse to praise uh, uh, Brene and his pics last week. I did. I did buy the little pocket light that he recommended last week, and it, it arrived. And I had to, like a takeout salad, <laughs> and so I was playing. And I, I, the salad was like getting warm as I was just like, <laughs> as I'm waiting, as like using different like video settings on this light to to get the lighting rate. But it wasn't just like the lighting that you got that was correct. It was also the idea that I went into Lightroom Mobile right on my phone and decided that okay, I really want this to be more detail here. I want there to be uh, the edges to be darker than the center. All this sort of stuff. And this is this is the reasons why I I get I get so frustrated that I've got like. Sometimes I travel with four thousand dollars for the camera equipment, and yet when things land in my my Google Photos and my Apple Photos account, I can't really tell which photos were taken <laughs> with a cheap with a three hundred fifty dollar phone. The Belkin. And which That's were all taken we can do with now. The, yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you bought a Belkin portable wireless charger and stand special edition Wiz 003. Belkin wants it back. They'll give you a full refund. Um, it, it, apparently, no one has been hurt. There's been no uh, property damage, but a manufacturing defect of the power supply can cause the charger to malfunction and overheat. That would be bad. So, PSA, folks. Yeah. Little, little public service announcement. You might want to return that. Uh, you could just do a search for Belkin portable wireless charger and recall, and you'll probably find everything uh, you need. <clears throat> Epic has taken the Fortnite battle with Apple to the UK. Um, according to Bloomberg, uh, the company is now uh, has submitted a complaint to the UK's antitrust tribunal. <clears throat> what a they put surprise! Used in the American complaint and refiled it. Yeah, what a surprise! <laughs> and uh, iOS fourteen point four, which is not out yet but is in its beta has an interesting uh, bit of code that will warn you if your camera was repaired or replaced with aftermarket components instead of genuine Apple components. Is this, uh, Renee, they've done this before, but is that because of security issues or reliability I, you know, issues? I, I, my guess is that it's because of corporate liability issues. Like my my preference would be that they don't prevent this stuff from working, but they do tell you so that if you think you're buying a new 
phone, you can go in and look and it'll say, sorry, not a new, but if you think you're buying a phone from somebody that has all the original parts, you can go in and see, oh, this was swapped, that was swapped. Right. And if the battery or something is not Apple original, you can go in and see that. I think information is always good. But the bottom line is if anything goes wrong, Apple is the one that gets sued. Right. So I think they, they, they just, they, they see where their most painful litigation is coming from and then try to Try to solve for that. That's it, with the battery warning. It it operates and everything. They just say, hey, you know, we're not we can't be held liable here. Uh, it's unclear whether this camera warning will uh, disable the camera or not. Probably not. I would guess. Yeah. Um, it, it really is consumer forward, especially because it's possible to reprogram uh, a, a battery to, to to lie about what its capacity is, lie about what its usage history has been. There are, there are counterfeit components that are flooding the markets because as uh, do-it-yourself, excuse me, as independent repair shops are becoming more prevalent, uh, it's probably getting a, it's probably a case of getting ahead of a problem. I would be complaining if Apple were saying, I refuse to, the camera app will not launch because it's, it detects non-Apple parts or non-certified repairs to your camera subsystem or I refuse to charge because I detect a non-Apple repair has been done to the battery. If all they're doing is informing the user that this is what we suspect and this is why we suspect it, then that's the definition of a pro-consumer sort of action. Uh, a lot of, I've been seeing a lot of chatter over new Mac OS beta code that uh, suggests that side-loaning uh, iOS apps will no longer be allowed. For, uh, right now, you can use iMazing or some other app to get the... Uh, app itself the app file itself uh so that you can install it on the mac even if it's blocked in the app store but you have to do it manually uh there's some evidence that ios 14.4 beta versions and mac os big sur 11.2 will implement a system that will actually block those apps from running on the mac so yeah the, there's some developers who are super angry about that because either they sell a mac version and they believe like this is a form of piracy right or they 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 don't want their thing running on a Mac because it's not an app that they're Maybe proud of. It's not a good experience. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, or it's a big gaming company that just doesn't want you to have the ability to do that. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people. For instance, Netflix is a, is an example. A lot of people, yeah. uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook. They want you on the website so they can cookie you. I mean, that's right. that's big for them. Yeah. So you can side load it uh, using uh, iMazing or something like that. Get the IPA file, but that's gonna probably stop in the next version of iOS and Big Sur. It was a big deal for them bringing iOS apps to the Mac because it, it is a touchy subject with a lot of developers. And I think the bargain they struck was if you're in secure mode, like the default mode, you could run those apps because then they're still wrapped in fair play and the developer gets to consent to them being run. But if you go and turn that off and you go back to like hobbyist Macity Mac mode, then you don't get to just run unfettered apps anymore. Uh, because a lot of those, it's the same as ROM, like ROMs and emulators and things. They get really touchy. So it's like just balancing consumer de consumer desire with uh, developer demands. Although there's an interesting uh, tweet from uh, Chance Miller saying, I don't, and I don't know what this means. Interestingly, Apple has reverted the server side change that blocked users from side loading. So for now, you can keep doing it, but don't expect it to last. So yeah, that's my understanding too. I don't know what's going on. I, but I've developers been trying, should let you if they want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the no, thing. I, I, you honor the developer's uh, request for whatever reason. Yeah. Right? I, I totally agree with the with the developer's argument that hey, we didn't design this to work on the app on the Mac. We're embarrassed by how bad it looks on the Mac, or for they don't even have to have a reason for it. I I've been trying to figure out exactly why Apple thought it was uh, so important. Why why having iOS app compatibility across two platforms was an important enough thing to actually make it into a, a, a formal feature. I don't think it's a bad idea. I just, when you make it, it's just that when you make it voluntary like that, I think most people, most developers are simply going to opt out and save themselves a whole bunch of problems. Uh, once you make something optional, that's the reason why Apple, the first Mac, didn't have function keys on the keyboard because you don't want to make the Mac support of the Mac mouse optional for any developer whatsoever. So I'm I'm curious I'm I'm going to be curious to, I'm going to be keen to find out in a year from now how many people are actually using iOS apps on the Mac desktop. It's not a great experience. I no, I, it's not as, as I was looking forward to it. And again, it's not it's not terrible. It's yeah. better than in, in many cases, it's better than nothing. But in most cases, the app that is available on the on the Mac, uh, excuse me, the, the app that's available in iOS 
is also available in some sort way, shape, or form through either a, uh, through either a desktop app or more likely a web browser app. Um, sometimes a, a browser app that can actually take its data with you. So I haven't really. I haven't I haven't found it to be a, 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 as much of a mind blower as I hoped that it was going to be. Yeah, I wonder I wonder if they they thought there would be more pushback from the loss of boot camp and that this would in some way be the big boot camp like mm. story. Like we went to Intel and that's how you can run Windows apps. We went to uh, Apple Silicon and now you can run iOS apps yeah. and just nobody really cared that much. Yeah, or or I could just as easily see uh, because of the way that Apple's been very very well managing its architectures and its roadmaps if they if some some couple of engineers figured out that hey look we we made we built this special version of xcode where if you just click this one button you can churn out a mac ver, a mac compatible version of this ios app and now we've got mac ios apps running on the on the mac it seems to work. We just did it for fun, also because there's something more important that yeah. we actually didn't want to do, like solving some MagSafe problems. Uh, and then it just <laughs> got enough traction that people said, "You know what? It it costs us nothing to include this. Uh, we will just we'll have to deal with some uh, public relations with our development community, but that would be a really cool thing to put into the announcement if we're if we're explaining why we're ditching the most famous and most popular uh, processing platform on the world in the world for something that we whipped up ourselves and our back in our back bunker uh that would be another another little feather in our cap i forgot to, i mentioned on windows weekly last week I, I forgot to mention it on this show uh you can now run sort of windows on your m1 macintosh using uh the pre-release of parallel i'm running it right now on parallels uh and then you have to use the uh, windows 10 pro insider build for windows on arm uh, some things work great. Office runs uh, just fine. I'm not sure if it's a, a PWA version of Microsoft Word, but it runs quickly and and so forth. And it and it's you know it's it's uh, completely doable. And then some things don't, um, like calculator. Uh, Paul Thorat says that's because it's a 32-bit uh, version of calculator, and so it's just not going to run. But uh, you know it works, and so for people who are you can't run the Microsoft Store either. Oddly enough, <laughs> I, again, thirty-two bit, I think. But Edge, I feel uh, like they're clouding everything. Like we, yeah. it's, it, we're like just so close to Windows being a web service that they're not really that intent on doing any of this anymore. Yeah, I I think that's completely right. That's Microsoft you're you're saying, and I think that's uh, yeah. completely right. But you can do it, and uh, so we yeah. were promised this back in the June at WWDC, uh, and. Parallels does. It's a pre-release version of Parallels, and it's a pre-release version of uh, Windows 10 on ARM. But, but would, I don't think work. it would surprise anyone if, like, next WWC they announced Microsoft. Microsoft recently announced Windows, you know, for Azure, and it runs great on an M2 Mac. <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah, it's kind of fun to run it. There's a coherence mode as well, which means you can run the, some Windows apps like Word. Uh, while you're like, as a window on the Macintosh, so you have access to both. If you've been hoping, as many of us had, that Apple at some point would make messages available on Android or Windows, maybe there's some uh, good news. Apple, last uh, actually in 2019, began hiring engineers to, quote, build the next generation of media apps for Windows. And now they've delivered. Apple is working on music and podcast apps to appear on the Microsoft Store. Sources told 9to5Mac that Apple's been testing these in a private beta. Um, that's all we know. That's Eddie's org. I mean, like, I believe the, the message, like all that stuff is very Apple-y, apple -y. And Eddie's, Eddie's org has their entire own software development team that does iWork and music and podcasts and all of those apps. Boy. And I think once they got music on Android, they just had to, it was just like, are we going to do it or not? And those, they use all very similar frameworks and design and implementation and everything. So nothing is ever non-trivial, but I think those are the, the nearest next neighbor apps for apple to move over especially as their services like i wouldn't be surprised to see the tv app uh yeah move over it's on well. tvs so for much, crying out loud so much audience for that yeah yeah and they make money yeah, on they, it they, they they can't if they're if they really want to gain traction especially with the content that they're creating they're not going to do it by being world famous in western massachusetts they have to reach <laughs> out to the entire world and that means that they're going to have to support android in some fashion they're going to have to support windows in some fashion uh or else they're just sort of admitting that we don't know how to we don't know how to write code if we can't control absolutely everything from top to bottom which I, is which is patently not true i said they make money on apple tv plus but not yet 
They have now. <laughs> no, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> but soon, I'll someday. Say, definitely, <laughs> definitely not yet. <laughs> Those of us who have uh, free subscriptions are now extended through July of this year. Yeah, uh, it, I mean, remember, it makes sense. They haven't been able to make or launch almost any new content, and it doesn't look like that has changed yeah. significantly. Right. For them. So if you bought an Apple, a new Apple iPhone or an Apple Watch or an Apple TV in 2019, you were given a year that theoretically expired in November 2020. They extended that to February and now extended again. And I have to say, uh, I'm watching Servant Season 2. Good. Um, I yeah, watched, they have a lot of good shows. <clears throat> I watched the new Tom uh, Hanks movie. Uh, News of the World. I, that was on Apple TV, was it? I think it yep. was. Twenty dollars, but it's good. It, you know what? Last night, Lisa and I said we're going to watch some uplifting stuff. <laughs> we want to watch something happy, and so we watched that, and it was very. It's a. It's a. TV Plus and movie. iTunes rentals have become really conflated for me. Like when I spend thirty bucks on Wonder Woman, I don't think that's TV Plus money. I think that's still iTunes rental money. It's it's very. It's unclear. Blurry, the borders yeah. now. It's yeah. unclear. Yeah. Um, yeah, and News of the World is available for basic your basic twenty dollar to get in on everywhere. Those services right. available. Yeah. You can get it on YouTube. It's yeah. one of those movies that opened Christmas Day, made a few million dollars in theaters, but not enough to support it, and they've released no. it as a uh, as an expensive rental on a lot of services. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else. Um, AirPod Max battery drain. Apparently, have you had any problems with the AirPod Max battery? I did not, but I know several people who did, and all of them managed to fix it by, I think all but one managed to fix it just by doing the reset, holding down the two buttons ah. on it and repairing it, and yeah. then it went away, which makes it sound like it was just bad bits to me, which sounds silly, but that's what happens. Yeah, even when left in the special Apple Razier, um, the uh, headphones the drained. Chaps. <laughs> the chaps drained from 100% to nothing overnight which is not what's supposed to happen. But yeah, that's interesting. You know, I mentioned last week that uh, my uh, iPhone 12 Pro Max had stopped ch charging on the MagSafe adapter, and a couple of people wrote to me, and Lisa reminded me. She said, oh, yeah, remember? We rebooted mine, and it started it again. It yeah. is a known bug, apparently, and uh, rebooting will fix it. I rebooted the iPhone, and then <laughs> Springboard worked, yeah. but I couldn't, there was no, resp it was unresponsive once I was in any ah. app. So I rebooted again, and now everything works again. So there's still did some you bugs. Did you reboot Windows, Laporte? Did you reboot your Windows? <laughs> there's, there's still a few bugs in iOS. I don't know where I am. 14 point. Is that, am I on two? I guess I'm on the latest, whatever that is. Three. Is it three already? That, that might be one they want to fix uh, sooner than later. I'm just saying. It's kind of a weird, the, the big a weird issue, bug. The biggest issue yeah, they have now, and it causes so much anger, is that... The, these things are so complicated that everybody gets different bugs based on their configuration, the software they're running, <coughs> sorry, the processes they're running. And even 1% of people having those problems are hundreds of thousands of people. But like they'll fix Wi-Fi and it'll fix it for the 1% that were having problems, but introduce it for the 1% yeah. like for one percent of the people who weren't having problems. And it's like whack-a-mole over a billion installs. Are you excited that now with the, you, they found out with a SIM, a SIM card adapter you can remove the headband? So Rene has already spent thousands on Apple watch bands. Now, now he can customize <laughs> his headband on his AirPods. Georgia mats. started swapping the cups and trying to steal them. She's like, I like this better. It took the cups <laughs> off of my blue run. So don't tell her. She'll take the <laughs> headband next. <laughs> yeah, apparently uh, there's even uh, some code in iOS 14.4. Uh, a headband type identifier. <laughs> it makes sense because both the cups and the headband are the things that are going to, like the the Everything else is really solid, but replacing the headband, replacing the cups, not only lets you customize them if you want, but also lets you, those things are going to need, like from your hair or from wear and tear, from your ears, they're going to get grudgy, they're going to get bad. And if you yeah. can replace that, it's better than replacing the whole thing. Uh, here is the best, believe it or not, during this past week, CES happened. No one noticed. <laughs> here, the best. Apple-related accessories, according to Mac Rumors at CES 2021, Pioneer introduced a CarPlay uh, head unit that, with a 6.8-inch uh, touchscreen and a hideaway control unit uh, coming this summer. No pricing yet. So uh, this is a, yet another CarPlay uh, head, head unit you can install on your car. LG OLED Ultrafine 
monitor 31.5 inches nice 8 million pixels hdr individual pixel dimming it's the first oled from lg um that's that's why the rumors about apple getting back into a, a less expensive premium monitor kind of surprised me a little bit because I, uh, historically they seem to only put things on the market when they don't think that other that third parties are making something that's suitable for uh, for for their hardware, and that now that there are so many other companies that are making really really good ultra HD uh, displays uh, with really really great performance specs, it's su it surprised me a little bit that they want to continue to make super expensive uh, monitors like that. Look at this. So the only thing I'll add to that is like they've always just taken so far for the last few years they've taken those LG panels, the exact LG panels they have in yeah. the iMac, and just rewrap them. But when they stopped doing that and they let LG do it on their own. You can say the design was pedestrian, but it was also bad. Like the first generation would interfere <laughs> with Wi-Fi routers because they didn't put tinfoil on it. The second generation just had all sorts like there's just threads and threads of complaints about how poorly it works. And I, I think and those are what Apple was selling in the Apple store because they had no nothing else to sell. And I think they're just like, yes, LG, you make very nice panels. You do not make very nice displays. <laughs> you will give us back those panels and we will take care of the rest again. <laughs> Thank you. I do say I do. As I think about my new Mac Pro Mini, <laughs> I am thinking about, and I've, you know, the problem is I have an iMac, so, but I really want one of those really wide uh, displays, yeah. and LG is, is showed yep. off a 39.7 inch 5K, 2K ultra wide like monitor. Like wraparounds? Yeah, I really want that with my new... Mission control. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the yeah. nice things about many of these displays is they have built-in KVMs, so... You could, or or you could split the screen and have you know a Linux box or a Windows box and a Mac uh, on the same screen. I I really like that flexibility. So I'm very intrigued by all that. Yeah. Once 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 you go back to like the sort of like uh, military bunker <laughs> sort yeah, of just, uh, multiple baby. displays. Once once you once you have the ability, I, I'm I'm down to only two screens because I'm uh, on this station at least. I've got the M1 that only supports one display. I used to have two displays up here and then another display down there. I kind of miss having that sort of like on deck circle for things I just kind of want to have visual access to. So yeah, that's uh, I've I've got so close to buying a huge super huge curved display. I've had that 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 thing in and out of my my basket so many times on so many different stores because it really does change the way that you work. So I'm like Nick Fury, where like how does he how does he turn his head? Like it's exhausting. I can't I can't do it. I just, I have one display right in front of me, and that's all I can focus on. And I try to. I get too tired with the side display. So I'm going to go for the unitasker, Leo. No that 32-inch display is going to be mine. <laughs> You're no universe, uni uh, Marvel Universe superhero, I guess. I was playing Galaga. They caught me. I was playing Galaga. <laughs> uh, if you have five devices to charge, Sateki has released a Dock 5 multi-device charging station. Uses uh, Qi and up to five devices at a time, as well as, I see, USB-C ports. So... Uh, I guess you put your AirPods on the Qi and then a couple of phones and a couple of iPads and uh, just to hope the house doesn't it's burn down. It's a family down. charger. It's, it's a, a family, family charger. charger. <laughs> yeah, I think school is actually probably a logical. Uh, Kensington has a studio dock for the iPad Pro that That's has nice. built-in wireless charging. That's yeah. kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, particularly with so many people who are using the iPad Pro essentially as a wireless Mac display. Uh, uh, with the with uh, another Mac on their uh, on their uh, same wireless network, that is such a nice tidy solution. Just to say nothing about how well it just simply works as a standalone thing. If you have a dock for it that lets you interact with it with a keyboard and a mouse in a very very natural way, and give you all the ports that you're going to expect in a desktop, it's yeah, such a great way to get value out of this thousand uh, uh, dollar tablet that you might have paid for. Three USB A ports, one USB C port, HDMI 2.0. Three and a half millimeter headphone jack, an SD card reader, and a gigabit <laughs> Ethernet port. Wow! Why, 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 why do I live in a world tree. in which my, my in which my iPad has more I/O than my <laughs> than my MacBook Pro? <laughs> That's pretty cool, and it's kind of it makes the iPad Pro look like a little floating um, iMac, a little mini iMac. So that's kind of cool. I like it. Yeah. Here's another uh, ultra wide, a Dell forty inch ultra wide in their ultra sharp category built in th usb3 compatibility uh 2100 bucks if i don't say a price or availability date 
like with the Kensington yep. Studio dockets because one doesn't exist. Uh, that uh, Dell monitor is available now. JBL Dolby Atmos soundbar has AirPlay 2 built in. That's nice. Here's another Belkin 2-in-1 MagSafe charger. Belkin announced earbuds, too. Samsung announced Samsung tags. This wasn't at CES. Uh, yes. it, was con it was concurrent with CES. And Samsung got a Samsung. They, <laughs> <laughs> they beat Apple to it. Uh, the AirTags uh, still were waiting for the Apple AirTags, but Samsung has uh, tags that work. They Can I just add, like, they're... Their event was much better, way better than any of their previous events last year. They're getting there. But the part that I loved, and I freely admit every company copies every company, but they literally came up on stage and says, nobody innovates like Samsung. We are unparalleled uh, in innovation. No. We're announcing the AirPods, the, the AirPods uh, Pros. Yeah. I mean, sorry, the AirPods Pro. Yeah. And I just thought, like, come on, read the script. Guys, uh, so the Samsung Galaxy Smart Tag and Smart Tag Plus, you may not want it. You, many of the features require a Samsung device, Samsung phone. Not even just Android, but yeah, Samsung. Yeah, Samsung. Uh, there will be, they don't have UWB yet, but they say we're going to do a UWB version uh, later this year. So right now it's basically a tile tracker that only works with Samsung. That's not so hot. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, they have new Galaxy Bud Pro with noise cancellation. Uh, $199, a little less than the AirPods Pro. But again, uh, I have a feeling they work best with Samsung devices. They're doing the ecosystem play like Apple. I feel so bad for uh, the Pocket Cast folks. Remember, public <laughs> yeah. media bought them. Now they're selling them. Uh, one, less than a year after they bought Pocket Cast, uh, Pocket Cast owners, which include NPR, New York Public Radio, Chicago Public Media, and BBC Studios America, maybe that's the problem, uh, agreed uh, last month to sell Pocket Casts. John Gibbons did not respond to Current's questions, calling the situation a fluid event. So I guess we don't know who bought them or for how much. This is it's still in my mind, and I have to say, Public Radio did not destroy Pocket Cast, but it's still in my mind, my favorite podcast catcher. Um, yeah. yeah. Russell Ivanovic is a, uh, is, we used to do the uh, uh, a Google podcast together, and he actually maybe he can come back to the, yeah, and it's it's just such a beautiful app. It's, 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 it's often that you come across an app where, it was developed by people who wanted to use this as their primary podcast podcast catcher. And every time something annoyed them or every time they found themselves wasting time, they implemented a feature. Or just as easily, as soon as more than three and a half people asked for a feature, they would take a look at it and say, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. So I hope that this – I hope that Pocket Cast continues to endure. It was eminently worth $3.99 uh, when it was actually being charged for. Uh, and so I, I'm, it's too popular an app to ever go away. So Yeah, and of course that was part of the problem was public radio did not charge for it. They made it free, uh, which means they lost a lot of money. In fact, uh, NPR, which is just a part owner, I think a one-third owner of it, uh, said that they lost $800,000 on Pocket Cast so, uh, in one year. So I could see why public broadcasting, which is kind of, you know, always running on a shoestring, said, eh, maybe yeah. we shouldn't be owning a podcast uh, app. Um, and uh, don't go to an Apple store this week in Washington, D.C. because <laughs> there's big fences <laughs> everywhere and you can't get in because they're closing those stores ahead of the uh, inauguration tomorrow. All right. I think, unless there's anything I missed, did I miss any stories that you guys wanted to talk about? I think we covered everything I had on my list. Nope. Yeah. All right. We talked about the teardown. We talked about everything. Yep. Let's get ready for... Our picks of the week, always my favorite part of the show. Pick of the week starting today with mm, Renee Ritchie. So my pick of the week is an app called Clubhouse, which actually isn't that new. It came out about a year ago, but it was invitation only. It's still iOS only. And I think the only people who were using it a year ago was Matthew, was Matthew Panzerino of TechCrunch and all the venture capitalists. So it kind of <laughs> fell off my radar. And I kept hearing intermittent things about, you know, like maybe the venture capitalists were a little bit, how should we say, not 
uh, encompassing, not diverse, and we're expressing worrisome amounts of those sorts of things. So I kind of totally discounted and discredited it. But then it started going wide again around two weeks ago, and I started seeing more and more people use it. So I went on to check it out, and I have... I have been enjoying it and maybe a little bit too much. Uh -oh. So if you're not familiar with yeah, Clubhouse, so, uh, it's Before you go on, I, Justine, yes. on Sunday sent me an invite, so I'm in there, and I'm <laughs> baffled. I don't understand what to do. I'm getting notifications. I'll explain it to you. What is this so it's, thing? It's, it's uh, a drop-in audio chat app. So you go into Clubhouse, and you'll see a bunch of rooms, and it, the, the key thing is to follow people that you know and trust. It'll try to get you to give you to give it topics of interest for you, but those are like gambling. Well, You're gambling with your sanity. There's a room right now uh, with 19 yes. people in it. What's the best letter of the alphabet? <laughs> so I don't see any of that stuff. I have it set to only show me oh, people that I follow. Okay. So I'll go in there and I'll see like Luria Petrucci teaching live streaming uh, or I'll go in there. And what I've my problem with it is that I go in there and I see like some of the best YouTubers and podcasters in the business talking about their business. And because it's still new, because it's like the early days of Twitter when there was one timeline and if you were on Twitter, you suddenly knew everybody, they're just all willing to tell you everything. Like all the biggest producers, the biggest managers, the biggest um, hosts, all of them just freely discussing everything they do for growth, for for uh, deals, for financing, for management. They had the people who run Space Station, which is Peter McKinnon's agency on there. They have uh, the people who do like Mr. Beast and Logan Paul and all of those sorts of endeavors just on there talking about how they approach content. But they'll talk until like four in the morning and you can't record it, you can't replay it. It is against so, the terms of service so to... Is everybody talking broadcast? at once? What is going on? I don't no, understand. So you have a moderator and the moderator can... The moderator starts the room, and then there's two categories. But it's categories. all audio, people, just audio. Yes. It's, it's like audio an audio only, chat room. And, absolutely. And okay. the, the people the moderator follow, so you have a speaker stage, which are people who can unmute their mic and talk. And then the next tier is people who are followed by the speakers. And then the tier after that is the general audience. And you can, if you're a moderator, you can bring people up on stage and push them back down off the stage. Oh, so it's like Alex you Lindsay's can make office hours, well. kind of, with audio only. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's very, it's very similar. It's very small features. One thing that's interesting is because Justine invited you, Justine's picture will always be on your profile as a person who vouched for you on oh, Clubhouse. So that's so why you want to be nice. It's not real accountability, but it's social accountability. Right. Yeah. Cause they'll blame her if you do anything, Leo. Got it. <laughs> totally go after her. <laughs> but like, for example, we started uh, Viper, who's another uh, tech YouTuber, myself and a guy called a guy named Jeff uh, Jefe, who does audio reviews, started a a tech YouTuber lounge every Saturday night. And we were in there this week and Justine and Jenna showed up and Brian Tong and, and Justine discussed how they were hosting CES and what that whole experience was like. And then you had like, and uh, a bunch of like super staff was explaining how he does brand deals and how he negotiates contracts, which people who are just beginning YouTube have no idea how any of that stuff works. So it's, it's very good for accelerating your learning into whatever industry that you're part of. And it's free, but you have to get somebody to invite you right now. Yes, and it's iOS only right now as well. Okay. Uh, like they, they do require a real phone number too, and they do say they have a real name policy. It is poorly enforced. I see a lot of people with not real names there, but they want that sort of level of accountability. Uh, so you need to give someone your phone number in order for them to invite you, which means you have to trust them enough with your phone number. So like a lot of social networks, right now it's dominated – by a certain group of people, uh, sounds like YouTubers, startup people, marketing people, but it's going to end up being chat roulette in about five minutes. So enjoy well, it no, now. So it's, it's already that, and so there, there is horrible stuff. Like there is anything. Like there is fascist, anti-COVID, racist, oh, anti-Semitic, all sorts of those things. But because I don't, I only. I'm only notified and I only see rooms that people I know and trust are in. I never see that part of it. They have to fi they have to work on that part and they have new buttons now like you can insta ban a troll and you can insta report an account for violations of okay. terms of service, which is like the simple stuff that Parler got kicked off for not doing. Right. But if you stick to people like if I go in there and I see Leo Laporte is hosting, you know, Leo and Andy and Alex are hosting a room on how to be a successful podcaster, I will join that and I will never see any of the of the sort of garbage stuff that goes on in so every social network. When when I first signed up, it, it gave me a, a tag cloud of interests, which I uh, yeah. tapped. And I gather that's why I'm seeing what I'm seeing yes. now. 
So yeah, how do I, I, I turn all that off? Turn all that. Okay. So <laughs> is that in settings? Where is that? I think so. Yeah. yeah. I actually didn't set it to begin with. So I'm not sure if you can turn so it off. So here's I, interests. I, and, you, and I could get yeah. rid of my, I could we should just uncheck everything and I won't see anything. Yeah. All right. And then follow people. You can follow people when you see them in the room. So if people are really smart and sharing good stuff, you can follow them yeah. and then you'll see it when they're in more rooms. I'm, uh, I have 57 followers and I'm following 87 people. Micah Sargent, Christina Warren, Shira Lazar, Kevin Rose, Baratunde Thurston, Ryan Hoover. Yeah. So I'm following good people. And so yeah. I will get a notification when those people... Um, start a room and if you don't like a room you can leave like i mr beast again he's a youtuber who just got to 50 million subscribers and he he was wow. running his room like he runs his channel with like extreme dedication to retention if someone asked a question that he thought wasn't interesting to the entire room or if he saw people dropping off he would immediately change subjects to try to keep as many people <laughs> engaged and interested as possible it seems that i have that there is focus. some flaws in this because i i i know i specifically did not follow jared leto I did not, <laughs> but apparently I am now following him, and I see a lot of other just people. Follow him. So there's he's people. He's just that charismatic. He's he's just on him. There's a lot of people. I I know I didn't follow Gary Vaynerchuk. I because I it's bizarre though too. Like on Saturday, the district attorney of San Francisco was in there with a bunch of like tech. I forget his name. The person who left TechCrunch recently to become a venture capitalist. Um, was hosting and they were talking about how they treat the homeless in the city of San Francisco and not since the early days of Twitter, the, the, the pre Ashton Kutcher days of Twitter. By the way, seen that kind of direct I'm also apparently following Ashton Kutcher. I know I didn't follow him. <laughs> so I'm going to unfollow. Sorry, Ashton. I don't want to break your heart, dude, but you had, you had your chance. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. There, I don't know why I'm following. There must be some auto follow going on. So it's new or it's not new. It's been around yeah. for a year, but it's, it's still invite only. It's and it's a little odd. Yeah. Oh, I know. Maybe it's looking these people up in my address book. Maybe that's it. It could be, or they could be. It could be suggesting people to you also based on the people that you follow. Yeah, it's added a lot of people that I did not add. So I don't know what's going. Mine on. Mine is still under my control. I go through it and look at it. I've lost, com I completely lost control. <laughs> 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 but I have to say, a lot of people I love and know are in here. Uh, so that makes yeah. it worthwhile. Yeah, I don't know. Somehow I'm following eighty people which seems like more than I had intended. Clubhouse. So how do people get an invite? So you have to, so there's a couple of ways. One is you can go to Clubhouse's website and sign up. And then what it does is alert anybody in Clubhouse who might know you. Um, and I think they're, they're connected to Instagram, Twitter, and you can also connect to your contacts. So if one of those things pop, like I saw several people pop up uh, and it said like, do you, like, I think it was, oh my God, Chad popped up and it's like, do you know him? You can let him in without an invite. And like, yes, okay. you know, you, you, you press that button and it works. Otherwise you can invite someone, but it only works over SMS. So you have to, you have to first be willing to vouch for them because your profile pic will be on their profile forever. And you have to, they have to be willing to give you their phone number. So you start off with like one invitation and the more you participate, the more you get. Ah. By the way, uh, Micah says you, it's it, during the initial setup process, it, it sets you up with a bunch of accounts. He says you have to uncheck those as you're going. Oh, that might be new. I didn't get those. That's yeah. interesting. Oh, I'm following 80 people. I know I didn't follow 80 people. And uh, by the way, my favorite letter in the alphabet is R, because without R, you can't have talk like a pirate day. Andy and Akko, your <laughs> pick of the week. Um, actually, I was going to glom onto yours because I had the same uh, the same app bookmarked. Uh, there's a new like writing uh, yeah do clear it. writing app. Called I have Spaces. other other ones I can do because I, I have a kind okay. of I have a traffic jam of apps. So go ahead. Yeah, it's now, I'll demo uh, it though while you talk about it. Please, please do. Yeah, this is there. This is part of a class of uh, writing apps where it understands that. Uh, Writing is not all about I'm going to open my I'm going to open a, a pages document or a word document. I'm going to write the document. I'm going to save it to a folder and then move on. You're often dealing with projects where there's uh, content from whole, all kinds of different sources where there are parts to it that you want to do. There, there are parts of it that are just notes on what you want to do. There's the finished product and then you need to be able to export it in whatever format is going to be useful, whether you're putting it online or putting it into a doc or something like that. Uh, so uh, uh, people have a uh, heard me recommend Scrivener, uh, which I still use and it's still wonderful, wonderful. It, it really is. It, it really is like they, the, 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 I, I don't know how to put it. It, it. it is the space shuttle of these kinds of apps. It is the most complicated 
powerful, useful, flexible tool for this sort of thing. I've got a research project for what I hope will be a book that's been going on for five, six, seven years. And Scrivener is the only app that can manage all of the research that I'm doing, all the images I'm dealing with, all the PDFs I'm dealing with. This is designed to, uh, Spaces is different in that I think it has a happy medium between a simple plain text markdown editor and the features of Scrivener that I really, really like. Uh, uh, it, uh, it's uh, it's more meaty than the stripped down editors that don't let you do flexible formatting because once again it's not always that you're just doing uh, bashing out plain text that has to go someplace else you're often really trying to deliver a finished document with media with uh, with formatting with all kinds of text uh, and it's also just as good I found as uh, writing a 3,000 4,000 word piece as it is for a simple oh someone's about to give me some information over the phone I quickly need to uh, make a note and make sure it's attached to this project that I'm working on. Quick stuff like that. Uh, it allows tags. It allows filters. It allows uh, writing templates. That's another big thing for me. Uh, the, the One of the limitations of a lot of these different uh, focused writing apps is that they will make a design choice on how they think that I want my window to look that will drive me batty after the first 800 words and then I'm done. I don't care how good it is under the hood. I just don't like the fact that there isn't enough white space between the side of the window and the start of the text. You can customize it however you want. It comes with templates that are that are that uh, that are starts with. Um, all, all I can say is that I've been using it for only about about a week and a half. Uh, one of the f first things I do at the start of the year is that for each of the different sort of like ongoing projects I have, I create a new document for that year so that everything that I'm writing for NPR goes into one bulk document so I can always have all this research and stuff together. Uh, and instead of creating a Scrivener document for that other stuff, again, that sort of catch all stuff, I started using spaces for it. And I haven't found a reason to switch to Scrivener for it yet. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've, the only thing that I always didn't that I didn't like about Scrivener for simple things is that sometimes it really is too big. It's too difficult to switch between a mobile app uh, and a desktop app for for that kind of stuff. Whereas Spaces has both iOS and uh, Mac desktop apps. They're beautiful. They're very very functional. I'm st the, again the fact that I've been writing thousands of words in it and haven't found a reason to go back to an app that I've used for about ten years. Is, uh, is endorsement enough. Again, I want to say that I don't think that it's a replacement for Scrivener, but it, Scrivener now has its rightful place as this is for someone who is legitimately doing something that's going to take years to build, has all kinds of moving parts from all kinds of different people. It really is the only app that is really, really good at organizing random data that you have to turn into something that makes common sense. Spaces, I think, is for everything else. Yeah. fourteen ninety nine a year if you want to get the premium plan it has a lot of neat features one of the ones one of the features i really like let me see i don't know if i can show you this is it has it supports the um the touchpad so as you're writing it will show in the touch bar rather it'll show it's one of the few apps that really uses yeah. <laughs> touch bar it'll show you your word count it has some uh, quick things so i can quickly add check marks uh to it and this is all in the touch bar uh so I, you know, there's some really cool features in this. It's very well thought out. It syncs using uh, iCloud. So uh, you, when you pay for it, you get all three iPhone, iOS, uh, iPad OS, and uh, Mac OS versions. And um, they all sync together, which is kind of cool. It reminds me yeah. a little bit of Bear. It has an import, by the way, right. for Bear. Uh, they say, you know, we were inspired by Bear, but we also, uh, it has an import for Ulysses as well. We also uh, had some ideas that were a little different. Uh, it's very clean. I agree with you, uh, and it's a it's a good deal right now. There, uh, I think they've they've got a deal on it right now. So they've, they've got a life. You can. It's normally fifteen bucks a year that you can still buy it for just one year or use the free version now. But they are offering thirty five bucks lifetime, uh, and they've extended they've yeah. extended that to the middle of February. Yeah. So you can still download it today. We use it for a few weeks, and I just you know what I decided to give them the money Me because yep. the, ex the experience I've had for the past few weeks. I mean, just just the idea of integrating an outliner into it that really works well. Uh, has it, it, it's the difference between uh, someone who wanted to create a more multi-document version of BB Edit, a more writer-focused version yeah. of BB Edit, versus someone who decided to make a more BB Edit version of Microsoft Word. This is like this has the tools you need to actually focus on a task and actually produce finished, polished results. So yeah. I, I, I just want to. If, 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 if can I say that it just sort of fit into my? I want to put money into a box and mail it to these people because it's such a beautiful app. And so, yeah. and fortunately, they've 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 thought of that. 
that, they gave me an option of not even having to put money in a box, of actually paying the money. Yeah, I ended up getting the Lifetime as well because it's on sale right now. And I thought, yeah, you know, I, I could use this for quite some time. And it's not a monthly I, or a yearly subscription. They have a lot of themes, a lot of different dark yeah. and light themes uh, as well. And it supports Markdown, which is a, a huge yeah. one for me. Uh, Markdown is kind of... Uh, uh, table stakes for a writing app for me so i'm yeah very nice nicely done spaces so that was going to be my pick but i had another one ready to go for next week so let's talk about <laughs> clear shot or clean shot this is a new um screenshot and screen recording tool that i really like uh also not free but it has a lot of really nice Features, in, including the ability to have no wallpaper, to eliminate icons on the desktop as you do your capture. Uh, when you do a capture, and uh, let me just do a capture real quick. Oops, I have to give it permission to do screen recording. Oh, this always slows me down. Uh, I'm not going to worry about this, or should I? Let me do it so I can show you. Because one of the things it does, it has its own cloud storage for your uh, screen captures. So uh, when you use it, uh, it gives you a lot of options. Uh, you can drag and drop, automatically share. There's some really, uh, I think, really good uh, tools built into this. This is a, this is a, I've talked before, Zapier also has a new screenshot program. This one's not free. So um, it might be worth, uh, you know, checking it out before you, um, you know, pay for it. But I think given all the features, it is, it is a pretty nice job this is uh from a company called make the web and it's called clean shot and it is a one-to-one -one replacement for the max built-in screen capture but it, it does a whole lot more um really very powerful tool so take a look at it at uh, cleanshot.com and it, and i get you get free clean shot cloud access they don't use icloud they use their own cloud so I think it's worth it. Let's just check. Let me get the pricing for you. Um, Twenty nine dollars for a single seat. They have multi seat licenses as well, and those are that's perpetual. So I think a good deal. Uh, Clean Shot X. That is it for this fabulous Mac Break Weekly. Next week, two weeks from now, Alex Lindsay joins us. Next week, maybe we can get Doc Rock or somebody to come by. But it's kind of fun just hanging out with my two buddies here. Renee Ritchie is at youtube.com slash Renee Ritchie. He's also doing a brand new podcast, uh, Apple Talk with Georgia Dow. How's that going? It's great. I just mentioned something about technology and she tells me how it interfaces with our brain and how it makes us react to and treat the world around us. And I just set up, shut up and listen. Nice. Uh, oh, and Georgia's channel is live. She put it live on Monday. She's got videos going up. Oh, now. nice. And she got her name, youtube.com slash Georgia Dow. Even nicer. Yeah. A little plug for Georgia. You're taking up your It'll plug time brain. to say nice things about Georgia Dow. Aren't you a sweetie? Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I talk about people playing with their phones, and she's trying to fix our brains, and I think it's just so much more important, important. and necessary right now. We need both of you. That's all I can say. Yeah. Thank you, Renee. Anything else you want to mention? No, uh, just I'm working my way through analysis of – January is like the slow month. In technology, tell me about like even it. when you're covering CES, I, I saw everybody complaining. Like everybody's numbers are down, and it's like that every year. CES coverage is like negative ten percent, and it, it's <laughs> it always just happens. So I just work on like I try to explain everything. I try to cover everything. I just want people who are planning their purchases for 2021 to have as much information as they can. So that's what I'm doing right now. Yeah, and if you want to dive deep on a lot of the things we talked about today, including the shot on iPhone 12, the iPhone Flip. The new leaks about the iMac Pro. Renee's got videos on all those subjects. YouTube.com slash Renee Thank you. Richie. Andy Anako, when's your next appearance on WGBH Boston? Uh, we seem to be back to Friday, so I'm going to be on Friday at 1 p.m., assuming that well, the, the entire show, not just me, got uh, got preempted last week for the uh, for coverage of the impeachment. But we, we look – fortunately, the, the republic can be in – might be in good condition that I can – that will allow us to broadcast on good Friday. Good luck. Uh, I go don't to, know. <laughs> <laughs> go, uh, go, go to WGBHnews.org, uh, and you can stream it live or later on. Very nice. 
We do Mac Break Weekly on Tuesday mornings, uh, at least our time, 11 a.m. Pacific. That's 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC. I mention that because you can watch us do it live. Of course, it's a podcast, so there's on-demand versions. But if you happen to be around at that time, go to twit.tv slash live. There's audio and video streams. If you're watching the stream, you should be chatting with our uh, fabulous community at irc.twit.tv. TV, great place to be. On-demand versions of the show are on the website, twit.tv slash mbw. If you uh, watch On Demand, then you can chat On Demand at our Twit community. That's www.twit.community. I want to uh, mention also we have our own kind of Twitter clone. It's through Mastodon. The Fediverse uh, is at twit.social. And I put a lot of stuff up on there, including announcements about our show, but also uh, news stories that we're following and things like that. So if you're uh, interested, if you're not already on Mastodon, twit.social. If you're already on Mastodon, go to your instance and follow at Leo at twit.social and at twitnews at twit.social. It's January. That means it's time for our Twit Audience Survey. This annual survey helps us understand our audience so we can make your listening experience even better. Completely anonymous. It'll only take a few minutes. Just go to twit.tv slash survey21. And thanks in advance. Oh, <laughs> we have a YouTube channel for Mac Break Weekly if you want to watch shows there. But the easiest thing to do is fire up. There it is. Fire up your uh, your Pocket Casts or your Apple Podcasts or your whatever podcast client you use and subscribe. If you you know even if you're subscribing through another podcast, leaving a review on iTunes always helps the show a lot. We've been around for so long. A lot of those reviews are ancient, and we'd like to get some more current reviews up there. So just do that in iTunes. Uh, you know, let let people know what you think of Mac Break Weekly, but only if it's nice. Uh, that's it. But yourself. That's it. For <laughs> Apparently somebody's trying to talk to me on, on twit.social. That's it for Mac Break Weekly. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Hey, folks. I'm Matt Pruitt, host of Hands of Photography here on Twit TV. I know some of you have gotten yourself a brand new camera or you just had a camera sitting around and can't quite figure out how to get the most out of it. Well, I have a solution. My show, Hands on Photography. So subscribe right now to learn how to get the most out of that camera. I'm going to show you how to make those images pop. I don't care if it's a Canon camera. I don't care if it's a Sony, Nikon, iPhone, Android, even an inexpensive Android device. I got you covered. So head on over to twit.tv slash hop and subscribe today. <laughs>